Hey, everybody. Welcome to a round table. This is round eight on tactical medicine and TEMS units. Now, you're probably wondering what is going on. There's only two people sitting in front of me right now. Um, so obviously I'm going to, I can break it down for you real simply. And I'm going to let, I'm going to let Randy introduce himself in a second here. Um, JB is also going to be joining us. So if you were on the, I let summit, you'll be familiar with JB, um, from his session on TACMED. He'll be here to answer questions as well. We had four or five instructors set up to do this call, but as you guys will understand, seeing as how we were looking for Thames operators, um, actually, all of them were called out to uh, certain operations in their respective areas due to rioting and um, and things that are going on right now. So we're gonna we're gonna make it work as it is. Um, and uh, I'm gonna let Randy introduce himself, give you guys a little bit of his background, and um, we're gonna start with some questions that were submitted prior to um, this thing. And then what we're gonna do is in the chat, you guys can start posting your questions as much as you want. Um, and if you would like, if you'd like to jump on a video in the chat, just send me a message, say, Hey, I'd like to jump in. I'll send you a private message and we'll get you on the call and you can ask your question to us via video. So that's going to be the game plan. So, uh, Randy, thanks for being here, man. I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to the conversation here. Uh, yeah, absolutely. What, give us a bit of your background. So everybody kind of understands where you're coming from and, uh, where they're going to be getting their information from today. Right. So uh, I'm a retired U.S. Army Special Forces uh, Master Sergeant, but I stayed a, a medic the whole time I was in that position as well. Um, multiple combat deployments, but I think the one that really applies here with uh, law enforcement typically is the time I spent with um, the Pacific Rim Counter-Terrorist Team. And in that position, I was, uh, I was the lead medic for the support element for the actual assaulters that went into buildings. So from that perspective, I've been able to uh, take that and work it into medical scenarios and work with Contra Group and, and several other groups and, and bring that to law enforcement and it's been successful so far. So that's kind of where I'm coming from uh, for this uh, discussion, I think. Awesome. Yeah, and um, just and the funny thing is, like we were joking before we kicked off here. I was like, I pretty much took everyone's experience and I just lumped it into one person. Um, and here you are to answer everyone's questions, which is awesome. Uh, so again, if you're watching this right now and you have questions, uh, please put them in the live stream. Uh, you can just put them into the chat. We're going to answer every question that you guys have about tactical medicine, about TEMS units or anything like that, anything that we can answer. And if I don't have the answer for you, as always, I will find it out and we will make sure we get that information to you. Um, before we start off and before we start answering questions, Randy, when when I say TACMED, uh, when we talk about law enforcement, what's the first thing that comes to mind for you that either something you've experienced or trained or something that really is a, a point of concern for you or something that you would always want to make sure that officers know before they get into anything? Yeah. So, so for me, from my experience, tactical medicine has been that point when the medic has had to move from his point of safety forward into uh, the, the high energy threat, whatever that may be. And, and many times the danger comes from, from different areas. So once, once you leave that, that point of safety, your vehicle, a wall, uh, so cover and concealed, um, as a medic, I, you, you can't really look at yourself as a medic any longer. You're, you're no longer performing the duties of a medic. You're performing the duties of an assaulter and you're entering a dangerous place. And so what I've seen uh, in, in real combat and uh, in many, many, many training scenarios is how you have to learn to interact as a medic with those assault elements, the, the, uh, many times, I think law enforcement here that we're speaking of, but um, they're inside and and they're just as concerned about people coming up from behind, even if they've cleared that and it's safe. And so now you have a whole nother set of tactical rules that you have to use to now interact with the police or the assaulters that are in that hallway. So now you can maneuver to the downed person and care for them. So does that kind of answer the question? Sorry. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, why not? 
Um, <laughs> why not? Um, there's there's a few questions here. There's um, one that just came in. And uh, so, Ben, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to send you an email. You can jump on and ask the question live here if you want. Um, but one of the questions that came in prior to this um, was, why does the TECC, so not TTRIC, but TECC committee continue to not recommend certain tourniquets? Um, do you have any idea on that one? So the TECC uses 100% of the advice from the Tactical Combat Casual Care Committee. And that committee is also recognized for, by the PHTLS folks. They, they uh, recognize that, that committee being the subject matter experts in tourniquets, we'll say. And that is overseen by the American College of Surgeons. And what has happened between the Tactical Combat Casualty Care Committee and the American College of Surgeons, they're, they're decades and continuous testing on commercial tourniquets that are available on the open market. And what they have found through testing is that there are only two that are reliable and meet all of the safety aspects that they're looking for in a general tourniquet. Now, there are many other tourniquets that are out there that are, that are good, they work, um, they're small, we can go all day on, on, but each one of them has a limitation as well. So when you give up the perfect tourniquet for something else, you now have to look at what is the limitation of what, what is different between this and the, and the one that is commercially approved by these large agent, federal agencies, we'll say. Um, I think that's as far as I need to go there. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, I mean, the most popular one out there, obviously, is the cat tourniquet. So uh, I think North American Rescue, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, here's the here's here's the one here's since I have no medical background, um, my one suggestion is don't go to Amazon to buy your tourniquets, just because there is a three for one deal. Um, probably not your <laughs> probably not your best <laughs> option. <laughs> What I tell people to do is to buy those and then label them with, with spray them with paint and use those as their practice tourniquets. Mm. Um, because the practice tourniquet, I mean, I hate to say this out loud. Um, I, I actually sell North American rescue products too. And it's the practice tourniquets, the same cost as the regular tourniquet. And I'm like, well, why do I want to buy the plastic, the practice one? It's just blue. I mean, so, uh, but um, you, I think the thing to remember with the cat tourniquet, that's the most important thing is that it's a it's only rated for a one time use, and people under people don't I think really understand that. And what the one time use is is once you start to twist that windlass knob, there's a piece of uh, a nylon that runs through that windlass that windlass bar, right? And as you twist that bar, it pinches that nylon. And so what they're saying is is that that tourniquet is rated to be turned so many times one time after that we can't guarantee whether or not it's going to work now what i can tell you is i've used dozens and dozens and dozens on on things that should have broke them and they haven't broke the 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 north american rescue product ones um so i'm very confident with those as far as the uh the cheapies that they go on amazon I, i've never actually used them myself but um i would also say having something is better than nothing so if you did buy the cheapy and that's all you got right now, keep it on you. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's better than a belt. So absolutely. <laughs> you know, it's better than a belt. Um, I have Ben on here. I'm gonna let Ben come up here and ask his question and uh let's see what he has to say. Ben, what's going on, brother? You gotta unmute your mic, my friend. There we go. Hey, so my question is for a basic patrol officer, say he's away from his vehicle for a period of time. Aside from a tourniquet, what would you recommend is like the bare minimum gauze, that type of stuff? I understand. No, that's a great question. I get that a lot from law enforcement and many other places. So the bare minimum is the tourniquet. Uh, I have a great story on that if anyone ever wants to hear it sometime. But um, the, the second thing I think that is really important is to have a hemorrhage control, hemorrhage control gauze, and then an ACE rash. Now, a lot of people push um, 
uh, uh, the, the emergency dressing. And I am 100% behind the, the medicine be and the, the reasoning for the emergency dressing. Great product. Does what it's supposed to do. But it's not compact. It's not, you can't hide it. It's not something you want to carry around all the time. Um, so you can typically get the, uh, the combat gauze. And that's a small square. You could fit that in just about any pocket if you're undercover. And then a, uh, an ace wrap can be flattened down over a couple of nights. And then I've seen those put into uh, holsters around the ankle. Um, and they'll have their gauze and their uh, ace wrap right there. And so with the two of those and the tourniquet, you have the ability to treat just about any wound on your body immediately. Does hmm. that answer your question there, Ben? Oh, Mike's muted again. That's okay. Get on mute your mic. Button. There you go. Oh, kids muted there. No, that answers it perfectly. Okay. Thank you. Hey, no problem, man. Thanks for thanks for being here, Ben. Appreciate the support as always, buddy. Hey, you got that? Uh, so everybody, so Ben was one of our winners from uh, one of the tactical breakdown pod. We did a giveaway um, at the beginning of the year, and you finally got your gear. Um, so that. Yeah. Was awesome. Um, I think you got, what'd you get? You got a, a, a three day assault pack, so a knife, some gear from LA police gear and all that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah. So the knife, uh, the knife, I think I ended up getting uh, stuck at customs there, but I got the, uh, the two bags of socks and uh, a light. So great stuff all around. I got a bunch of, I got a bunch of gear here that I'm going to send you also. So stand by for that. I'll send it off. Um, Sounds great, man. Thanks brother. Yeah, you bet. Um, so one of the things, uh, so Ben's been a great supporter of us, um, just so everybody understands he's been around supporting us since the beginning. So I really appreciate Ben being here. Um, and I was thinking of gear, um, and I'm rocking my ETF shirt. So the Toronto, uh, emergency task force team, um, uh, unfortunately none of their guys could make it tonight either, but I want to give a shout out to those guys cause they're awesome. Um, next question that came in, um, an EMT trying to get TAC med certified. What's a good path to get good training? That's a good <laughs> question. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I can answer, actually. I, uh, I, I don't know the civilian path anymore for tactical medicine. Uh, I was uh, just because of my background with, with uh, special forces and then with the, the State Department um, courses that I had, I was never required to take anything outside of, of that, plus be an active nationally registered paramedic. So, um, I don't know. Uh, if, if you want my personal opinion on what do you need? Um, and from what I've seen is you need to take as many classes from as many different agencies or companies, private companies, typically that deal with, um, law enforcement, tactical medicine, because I've seen three or four different approaches to it. And, what I'll say is I like the way JB runs Apex. I mean, it's beautiful. It goes off to almost the same kind of stuff we used to do. Mm. Um, but there are also going to be situations where other techniques are maybe needed. And so I'm, I'm not knocking any tactical medicine course um, because it's, it's always knowledge that can potentially further your, your, not, your, your personal understanding, one. And then two, the more hands-on you get, uh, that's really what, what it comes down to. And I've been instructing tactical medicine now for 18 plus years. And, uh, I tell people a lot when I, uh, one of the first experiences I had coming out of the, uh, the special forces medic course, the 18 Delta course, and I got sent to New York city and for my paramedic rotation. And just before they, we left the, the, one of the instructors said, <clears throat> Do you know why we show you so much gory stuff on all these slides and we make you practice for all these nasty scenarios? And we were kind of like, okay, what? And he said, it's so that it's shock value. He goes, because the first time you see this in the real world, no matter how much training you've had, your brain falls out of your head and lands on the ground. And what we're trying to do is speed up the amount of time it takes for you to scoop your brain up, shove it back in your ear, and get to work. 
And people that have experience typically pick their brain up faster and start working. And I remember that first experience. And, and right after that experience, I said, holy cow, he was absolutely right. I froze for like, you know, a lot, like five, six seconds, maybe. First time I'd ever seen something like that. So, so I think training all around is great as far as what you guys need for tactical certification uh, for law enforcement. I think it varies a lot state to state. And I think we're, we're talking about international lines too now. So I couldn't directly answer that. Sorry. No, it's good. I, uh, well, that's one that we'll get the answer for you. Uh, so, so Jeff, we'll, we'll do our best to get that for you, brother. Uh, I have a, no, if you look at the screen there, uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, <laughs> we'll have words later, sis. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Randy's sister's making comments for him. Um, so there's some, some comments here. Um, here's one that came up. Uh, maybe you'll be able to make more sense of this than I will. So it says we had a POI with two 300 blackout wounds to abdomen and two overpen beanbag round wounds to the leg. Paramedics missed the gunshot wounds. How normal is that? Yeah. <laughs> That's super normal. Um, best story that I have to address this. AK-47 round through the hip. Uh, it came in uh, right hip, exited three inches below the groin um, from 90 feet away. Uh, uh, traveling at such high velocity that the initial impact uh, and cavitation was at such high velocity, it went, it went straight through. Um, but the velocity alone snapped the femur. But as it exited, it hit the thigh on the left leg. And when it hit the thigh, now it was already mushroomed and it shredded the thigh on the left leg. So when the first guy came up onto this casualty, he saw the left leg wound and a lot of blood. So the first thing he did was, you know, doing the quick check, he threw the tourniquet on the left leg and then proceeded to get shot himself and rolled behind cover. Um, about as that was going on, the gentleman, I'll leave his name out of it, that was on the ground um, is putting his own tourniquet on his right leg and then he goes unconscious. Uh, a very good medic friend of mine, Scoots up on the objective finally after two or three minutes. And as he's coming up, he notices, he says, I saw the left leg and I was wondering what, what's going on because I see a tourniquet there. And then he looked over at the right leg and there was nothing wrong. But he noticed the tourniquet high up in the thigh. And he said, why is there a tourniquet in the thigh? And he dropped straight down, cut the pants open, and he could not see an entry or an exit wound right then but the thigh had already um, taken on some size because the tourniquet wasn't in place properly. It wasn't tight enough. So the blood was still bleeding down the leg a little bit, but there was no, there was, there the return was the only thing stopped because it was just basically constricting band. It wasn't a tourniquet yet. So he tightened that tourniquet down and, uh, uh, and, and officially stopped the bleeding and that's what saved his life. Um, so it's, it's not uncommon for people to miss the, the entry exit wound. I have, well, it's, I won't say a great photo, but it's a photo of uh, a gentleman who got shot by a small caliber bullet. I think it may have even been a 22. It was in Iraq, um, but it had entered, it had entered right back here. Sorry, you can't really see it. Uh, right about there in the armpit and it had gone in and he had bilateral sucking chest wounds from that um, and died from that. Nobody found that until the autopsy. So, yes, missing, um, missing wounds. If you don't strip the body naked in a trauma situation like that, uh, you're, uh, that's not uncommon. But in that situation also, I'm going to just throw this caveat in there. That person should be naked. So uh, if they're standing there talking to you, I mean, I've done this to my friends. If they're standing there talking and you just had a landmine blow up in their face and you can't figure out why they're still there, you got to get them naked and look because the the trauma of the event, the adrenaline, your freaking ears ringing, uh, even with ear pro on, it, 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 it masks things. So don't be a hater to the medic that missed it, to the medic that missed it, 
you might want to work on your your patient casualty assessment again and there is a, a, a trauma assessment that you, you, that every medic should know and if they don't then they they need to work on that let's talk trauma assessment for a second uh, because it's you know, we have officers that are going to be watching this that aren't trained medics. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a, it happens all the time. You're, you're with your partner, you're with yourself. Something happens, you get into a firefight, weapon comes out, something's involved, you get injured in some way, shape or form. Can we go over self checks and buddy checks and really the best, the best, most concise way to do that so that we don't miss anything? Absolutely. Uh, so the, the committee for tactical combat casualty care uh, adopted, I think it was five or six years ago, the word March. And most military elements now um, in the United States use it as well. Uh, there are some other acronyms out there, but I think March is probably one of the best acronyms to use for uh, patient assessment and personal assessment. And what it does is it puts the five checks that are required to make sure somebody's alive and kicking in an order. And that if you ever forget where you're at in the sequence, you just start over at the top of the order. Because again, it's it's the most important first, and then it goes down that direction. And what I'll add before I discuss what March means, um, had March been utilized properly from what that previous scenario was just given, uh, the bullet wound should have been found in the C-section. I mean, that, that's just how it's supposed to be done. And secondly, March is repetitive. It never stops. So once you complete it one time, you start back over again. Until higher medical authority comes, you just do March over and over and over. You just march on. That's why I think somebody adopted it somewhere because it sounded catchy for the military. But... Uh, but you just keep repeating it. And it's that repetition of the five, five things that really keeps a person alive. And it's what stabilizes them. And it doesn't take a lot to stabilize a person, just very simple things. And so M, March, M stands for massive hemorrhage. And so when they're looking for massive hemorrhage, that's where we talk uh, extremities, legs, arms. Um, and the only treatment we're looking there is a tourniquet. Do we see massive bleeding? And if we do, we stop it immediately. Um, now, this is under TECC and TCCCC. I don't know what TEMS necessarily support. Some places don't support the tourniquet up front. I'm throwing it out there, but March utilizes that. So M is massive hemorrhage, tourniquet on an extremity. A, airway. Um, for the typical patrol officer, you're going to use the airway as, is it intact? Is, is it physically there and intact? Most uh, gunshot wounds, uh, pi you know, hit to the head with a pipe or a brick, you know, the, the, the face right here is typically not damaged. So if you can look at it and the airway is not damaged, the only thing that we really have to be concerned with is them swallowing their tongue when they're unconscious. So there's a couple of different ways that that can be controlled. I won't go into that here, but for the most part, when people are unconscious and it's intact, they will breathe on their own just fine. So that's airway. Um, if you have an airway problem, you're kind of stuck there because if you're by yourself and this is all messed up, and you have to maintain it, then you're stuck right there because you can't check anything else without letting go and then losing the airway. And that will kill them uh, just as fast as the massive hemorrhage because you've only got two to three minutes for both. So, so you need to kind of think about the airway thing. Um, I've had that in a lot of scenario-based events where they go, but I haven't finished my checks. I'm just stuck here holding his airway open because he can't maintain his airway. I'm like, right. That's kind of where you're at, and that's where you need help and things like that. So uh, airway, boom. If it's intact, they're breathing, we move on to R, which stands for respiration. Now, respiration, um, you have to look at it as, as a, I like to say, a box. Um, but it's 360 degrees, 
around your thorax, your upper body. And when you say respirations in medicine also for trauma medicine, it means neck to navel. So that space between the neck and the navel. And the reason is, is because the diaphragm moves up and down when you breathe. So if something was to penetrate above the navel line around the body um, in an upward direction, then it is potentially poten penetrating a lung. And so that is our respiratory box. Okay. And that's what we're checking in the R is the box. And so when we look at the box, we're looking for holes. And um, the, the biggest thing that I've seen in the real world, people missing holes is because they don't uh, what we call express or stretch the skin. Um, and you have to stretch the skin, all of the skin. You have to stretch it out, especially an unconscious patient. I've done it personally to the guys that have had GSWs uh, in one spot, and I've done a complete check to make sure that there was nothing else that has gone in there. You can't miss any of these, so you have to find them. So, so stretching the skin, taunt, looking for any type of a hole. And we don't have x-ray eyes, so when you find what looks like just a little, oh, he got a little scratch, I'm not worried about it. No, nope, you treat that like it's a sucking chest wound right off the bat. So that's kind of, that's the, the respiratory area, right? So R, M-A-R, respirations. And the only thing you're really looking for right now are holes. And if you find a hole, you plug it. Um, then we go on to C. Now C is circulation. Um, and what they're referring to here is, is kind of twofold. One is we have to identify every wound on the body. And then... Two is uh, we have to confirm that we haven't missed anything or something that we've done hasn't or is not effective. Excuse me. Sorry about stumbling on my words there. But something we've done for C is still, if you've done it in M, let's say you've done the tourniquet, when you get the C, that's something you now have to check because it's in circulation. It, it's talking about bleeding. So uh, C is to look for additional wounds and injuries and then check any interventions that you've done. Uh, in the C portion, I teach people to check for broken bones while they're also looking for wounds. Uh, the reason I do that is typically people will try to ambulate and they don't know they have a broken limb or something like this. That's one reason. But also, if they're unconscious, it, it, it can be done simultaneously. What I want to say is you don't treat, you're only treating the life-threatening injuries. So broken bones aren't life threats, so we don't treat them, even if we find them. What we're looking for now is circulation problems. So no bleeding, no additional bleeding found anywhere on the body, front and back. Then we move on to H. H for the military stands for hypothermia and head injury. Um, and so uh, where I'll take this on, on hypothermia, uh, once you've treated a patient uh, and they're stable, we typically have the, uh, we, 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 we ramp down a little bit uh, if the tactical situation is still ongoing um, because we're trying to, one, care for this person, but we're also trying to see if there's more tactical things that need to be taken place. Do we need to go get more, more people that are injured? What's going on? Uh, and what has happened uh, through history is that these patients have been left alone and you're down a few pints of blood. So your body cannot warm itself properly. And if there's any sort of a breeze, if they were sweaty, um, which they probably were, uh, they're already dehydrated, too, because they've been sweating it out. So the hyperthermia part comes in from all of these other aspects that people really weren't putting together properly. And what we found out is that when hypothermia starts to kick in, uh, blood clots just fall apart. They dissolve. So any wound packing you did um, potentially starts to bleed again. Any, uh, uh, well, I won't say tourniquet because a tourniquet is a tourniquet, but it mainly goes with wound packing. Where that's a problem is that a lot of people will go straight to wound packing and it's great and they get hemorrhage control really fast and they never had to use a tourniquet and that's what it's for. 
uh, good pressure bandage. Done it a hundred times myself, honestly. Um, and it's great, especially when you didn't have to use a tourniquet. You feel good. Um, but if that patient was to go into hypothermia, uh, 92 degrees Fahrenheit, those blood clots, and you can look it up on YouTube too, and on science stuff, they literally just dissolve. And as they dissolve, they start to bleed out again. So it's, it, it's a compounding problem. So, and once it starts, you can't stop it. Uh, it just, it's, they're done from everything I've seen as well as studied. As far as the head injury part goes, there's a lot of different things to do with head injury. As far as, far as the common person goes that I teach, uh, what I say to do is uh, and, and talk to them, see how they're feeling, see if they feel nauseous. But the biggest thing that I use as an indicator for head injuries is the eyes. The eyes are the, the, the window to the brain. And so what I will tell people to do is get out your phone because everybody has one now and you get on in there and you get a picture of both those eyes in one photo right now. And then you keep talking to them. And in five minutes, you take another photo. And in five minutes, you take another photo. And if they start acting funny after that, you take another photo. And what we can do is we can look at the eyes and see a progression. Uh, sometimes um, some head injuries come on slowly. They're slow bleeds, and so that person is going to slowly start to deteriorate. And and if this happens, we can typically see this in an eyeball. will start to do something funny. Both of them will do something different. So it's a good indicator for non-medically trained personnel to watch. It's easy to do, and then you can also have something to give to medical uh, professionals when they show up or when you deliver them to someone and say, this is what it did, and this is how it progressed. So... I think that's where you need to kind of go with head injury. Does that answer everything? <laughs> I think so. Um, Gavin added on here. Um, so he was the one who asked the question about the beanbag rounds and the missed uh, entry, entry and exit wounds. Um, he, uh, he said that they added an E to the end of their March acronym. Yes. Which stands for everything else. Everything else. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. I... I, I I was around uh, helping put this together when all this was really being invented. And I've seen a lot of different things. I've seen a lot of things added on to the end. Uh, I, I've just stuck with the march. And then uh, a lot of army units, uh, active army units, teach the march E also. But to, to me, E really means reassess. If I, if I had to add a, a letter on the backside, it would be an R which means reassess, which means start over and do the whole thing again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He said it's actually a bit of a reset mode for them to put their brain back in stage. So, okay. Like you had said, um, question here from crystal. What is the top three items everyone should have in their vehicle? That is not in a typical first aid kit. That's, that's well, it depends. It depends what you're talking about. Typical first aid kit. I right. suppose my, my typical first aid kit, <laughs> there's a lot more stuff in, it in the car in my car so right. that's because that's a second for me it's not it's not like an ifac so what's my car is a, a pretty extensive kit for yeah. mass drop in case i roll up to some type of multi-vehicle incident um i have i have enough stuff in there that i can actually have little throw bags to throw out to people oh uh, perfect so uh anyway i'll let you let I'll let you handle this one. What do you think on this well, one? I was say how many throw bags do you have? Because what I've typically seen is five throw bags in a kit, a couple of different kits that are out there, but they'll typically have five little IFACs. Um, so the IFAC with, so individual first aid kit, uh, and in that pouch, you'll have a tourniquet. Typically, people use uh, uh, the emergency dressing. Again, I like uh, ACE wraps. Um, multiple uses for them, you know, we can do a splint, uh, an ankle and stuff like that with them if we have to. Can't do that with the emergency dressing. So, uh, but a tourniquet, a dressing or an ACE wrap, one or two regular S-roll gauzes. Um, remind me about gauze. I'd like to talk about gauze real quick when we're done with this description. Okay. And they're, they're, it kind of goes a little deeper than just gauze, but I don't want to talk about it here. So, um, so two gauze and then one hemostatic control gauze. 
Uh, and then a vented chest seal. Uh, not There's not a lot of vented chest seals out there anymore. And and some I know somebody's already throwing the hate out there. They're like, vented chest seals, they don't work, bro. Uh, no, you're right, they don't. Um, but that's what's out there for people that can't get needles for needle decompressions. So uh, go with it. If it works for you, then you're in luck. If not, you have to burp the wound. And if you want to get information on that, you can look it up. But um, so there you go. So a tourniquet, the dressing or an ace wrap, two regular gauze, hemostatic control gauze, and a chest seal. That is a basic IFAC. You have to have those for a basic IFAC. If you had five of those in a vehicle, um, now you're able to take care of up to five people. Uh, and if you have people in your own car, you, you definitely want to treat those first before you go hand it out your stuff. So, yeah. That, yeah. yeah. My, my, my comment would be if you have a first aid kit and your core components are triangle bandages, uh, burn cream, and uh, <laughs> I don't know what else would you fucking find it. <laughs> yeah, first. the burn cream we can wait for. <laughs> if, that's, if that's in your first aid kit, you need to reassess your priorities. So, so the gauze thing I wanted to say. Yeah, yeah, go. Cool. <laughs> um, so a lot of people haven't used hemostatic gauze for real. Uh, and, and they don't really understand what the process is. So there's two basic approved products now. There is the, the combat gauze, which is a pectin base. And you've got chyto gauze, uh, which is chitosin base. Um, both of them have... Uh, an, an electrostatic charge to them, if we want to start talking chemistry, and so does your blood. And so when this little molecule sees this little molecule, they go, oh, hi, I'm negative, you're positive, boom, and they meet up. And so that process is what essentially speeds up the clotting process, right? But where I've had a lot of problems with hemostatic gauze is that even young medics have taken it and they haven't packed it properly. They've put it in very loose. Um, the bleeding wasn't actually, the, 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 the actual vessel that is bleeding, that's what the hemostatic gauze has to come in contact with for that process to work, to make a clot right there. If you put it out here, sure, it's gonna make a big clot in the space, but it's not a clot that's effectively stopping the bleed. So you need the hemostatic gauze to be on top of that bleeder. So the problem is people just don't understand how to do that. And hemostatic gauze is, I mean, it's $25, I think, for the, the compact gauze and I think $35 for chitosan. So it's not cheap by any means. However, with that said, uh, that stuff wasn't around for decades. Special Forces, uh, Rangers, um, I know all of the uh, uh, SEALs and PJs, you know, we learned regular gauze packing. And the way that we were taught um, explains the process of what you what really needs to be taught in the hemostatic gauze process. And there's only one thing in the world that stops bleeding. And that one thing is pressure. If you don't have pressure where it's bleeding, you will not stop the bleeding, period. So when we went through school and we learn to pack a wound, you know, or you're, you're shoving your finger in a wound to put gauze inside and you're feeling around for all the holes and cavities. When you're shoving that in there, what we used to say was pack it to the bone, pack it to the bone. And the reason we said pack it to the bone is because along every bone in the body, um, there's three things. It's a nerve and artery and a vein, NAV, nerve, artery, vein. And if you can't effectively visually see where the bleeding's coming from. If you pack it all the way down to the bone and put pressure on those great vessels, and then you pack it as tight as the bone all the way around that wound. Um, I've personally put five rolls of gauze on a guy's thigh. No kidding. It, it's crazy. But the pressure, and then you wrap that pressure. The pressure is what's causing the clot. It has nothing to do with that hemostatic agent. The hemostatic agent's nice if you have it and you're trained on it. 
But I don't. I think a lot of people get wrapped around the axle on trying to push the guys, and without training and knowing how to pack a wound, it's really not that effective. It's. I, I'm going to say it's better than regular gauze for nobody who's ever had it, but it, it it's an expensive thing that I think regular gauze addresses just fine once you know how to pack it properly too. So it's a training issue and, and yeah, I'll just leave it there. <laughs> uh, question on that. A lot of people have seen quick clot. Yep. As the powdered form of quick clot. I think we no. stopped using that. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. Can you, and, and, but some people still have it. I know people I talk to, they're like, I still have quick clot. And I'm like, okay, so do you want to cover that real quickly as to, first of all, is it good or bad? And why did they get rid of it? Okay. And I'm going to add one more to that is there's, there's generations to think about. So like I said, I'm really old. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was part of these studies that were ongoing. Some of them I knew about, some of them I didn't. I was actually part of the study that looked at the hemostatic agents when they first came out because they they came out, they were tested, rapid testing, fielded, they went off to Afghanistan and then special ops started having them and then there were some problems. And once the problems happened, everybody's like, Ooh, we better look into what's going on here. So the original quick clot uh, is a small granular pebble, Gen 1. And so don't quote me on the temperature here, but I think it was like 170 to 180 degrees. So what happened was the chemistry behind it is that it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's basically a lava rock that's ground up into granule form and it has an affinity for moisture. So whenever it sees moisture, it says, and it pulls it in and it creates this hot spot, which basically kind of, start cooking everything and making a blood clot out of that, right? Um, and it was fantastic because uh, it was one of the first things we had. And, and when there was no way to address uncontrollable bleeding, it was a new option. Uh, but what happened was, is it was used improperly several times. And one of the, the, the ones that I can recall for sure is that there was a Marine, uh, um, E6, I always get their ranks messed up. Sorry about that. I think staff started still. But a Marine E6, he had gotten shot in the leg and his medic was all gung-ho. And he was like, oh, heck yeah, I got this new stuff, dude. We're not even going to put a bandage on it. We're going to just sprinkle this magic fairy dust. And it's going to cause a clot. And then you can keep fighting. And so that's what they did. They sprinkled the magic fairy dust. And by the time they got him evac, it had burned so much of the muscle tissue that they actually had to amputate the leg. Um, he lost the whole leg. So the first generation stuff is is the stuff that's dangerous if it's not kept in a controlled scenario. I would I mean I would never tell anybody. I mean if that's all you got, throw it out. Um, know what you have, and uh, and understand that it it will cause significant burns. Now the Gen two came out. <laughs> And the first thing they did was they figured out a way. Oh, and sorry, what I forgot to say was the heat is created because of the movement of molecules. So when you got water sucking out of a cell going over to a lava rock and it moves so fast that it's, it, it literally creates steam. And, and that movement across the cell membrane is what's creating that heat. And so that's what they found out. So, so the Gen 2 came out and what they had done is they had changed the one is they it changed the size of the molecules. So they were a little, the, the, the pebbles in the, the powder. So they weren't as small, so they didn't, they didn't operate as fast. And so they didn't heat up as much. And then they did some other things so that it only, I think, I think the maximum temperature on the second gen, somewhere around 110 degrees. And that's hot. It's gonna be really hot, but it's not enough to devitalize tissue any longer. So that's really good. And then you've got the, uh, the movie, The Sniper. Oh yeah, but it's, uh, uh, where he, uh, he breaks into the back of the FBI car. He pulls out the first aid kit and you see the quick clot pouch and he pulls it out and it's a little beanbag looking quick clot pouch and he stuffs it on him. Um, again, that was another thing quick clot did to try and negate the heat process. So they were still trying to suck all that blood out, uh, kind of cook those proteins. So they create a uh, 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 blood pudding. <laughs> Sorry, my, my chemistry brain likes to have fun sometimes. 
<laughs> so they're creating a little blood pudding there. And, uh, and, and the, the, the powder was in a bag so it didn't spread to any other moisture, maybe sweat, things like that. Because anything that was wet heated up with, with the original Gen 1 and Gen 2. And then what happened was is Kytosin came out. And Kytosin is from a shrimp shell. Uh, they, they take and they process the shrimp shell down and they take a protein out of that processing. Um, that protein to this date, I think it's, I think two, two or three decades now, there are zero uh, um, <clears throat> shellfish allergies have happened. So it's a protein, not the actual shellfish. I want to throw that in there as a caveat for people. Um, so that protein, again, is positively charged and blood's negatively charged or vice versa. I can't remember. But, you know, they like each other and they meet up. So when that came out, its efficacy was through the roof because it didn't get hot. It, it liked blood and it was uh, it was bacterial static. So it um, it didn't allow any bacteria growth in the wound that may have been there from the gunshot or the explosion or things like that. So that was really a, an added value. And then the other thing was, is it could be debreeded out super easy. And then well, what what most people call super easy. I mean, you'll, you'll see some YouTube videos where it looks pretty nasty, but all in all, most of it's super easy to get it out. And then the last thing I'll throw in there is that uh, chitosin can be absorbed by the body. And, and I think it, it in, the, in the breakdown process, it just becomes a glucose. Um, so the body processes it and it's, it's not harmful, it's safe. And so that kind of took an upper shelf. And what happened was, is they were starting to push for military contracts. Um, but combat gauze had already started, or, or quick clot, had already started working on combat gauze. And if you go back in history and you look at um, basically what they did is they took a, a World War I <laughs> trick that the surgeons did over there in France. They used to use uh, there's these mines, pectin mines, and they would, they would mine this powder. The powder was typically used for cooking and things like that. It was, a, it was a gelatins and stuff. It was a thickener. And what they found was as if they poured it into a bleeding wound on the battlefield and they packed it real, wrapped it really tight, it, it would help stop the bleeding. Um, and then with modern science and things like that, they basically added on to it a little bit. And they said, wow, this actually really works really well, but we don't need like big bags of powder. We just need to impregnate gauze with it and then it's effective. And so that's what they did. They, they uh, came up with a process for taking this powder um, and, and they, they put it into the gauze and then they S rolled the gauze so that and they were one of the first companies also to S roll gauze so that as you pull it out, it doesn't, the roll doesn't just go flying off. And, and so when the time came for military contracts, uh, combat gauze won because it had better user application um, across the board everybody had easier application with it and it was cheaper uh, like i said i think ten dollars a pouch cheaper and i know government contracting has different rates but if you're just looking at the basic msrp for it um that's why combat gauze became the the go-to for the military and, and kind of the history behind it so um yeah gen one gen two hot everything after that does not produce any heat so there's no more no more cooking problems. <laughs> awesome. Well, we have a new guest. <laughs> hey! <laughs> Your mic's muted there, big guy. Yeah, that would help too. It's been one of those days. What's going Good on, brother? Guys. Not a whole lot. Good to see right. you guys. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for joining us. I know you got pulled away for a briefing, so it's all good. Thanks for joining us and taking the time, man. Yeah, no worries. Um, question that, uh, so we've been just going over a few things. Um, Randy went over some stuff with March. Um, and the last question we were talking about, uh, quick clot and, and those types of things. Um, and then so a few people have mentioned here in the comments. Um, let me see if I found one. I saw one that I wanted to bring up here. Hang on a second, two seconds. Uh, this one right here. I heard that quick lot worked on some people and sea locks works on everyone. <laughs> I'm, okay, I'm, so, assuming, I'm assuming Randy probably already touched on that. Uh, well, not quite, but you, do you want to answer that one directly? <laughs> uh, so 
to, to say that anything works on any one is what would kind of be a, a misnomer uh, to a certain degree. Um, both compounds have uh, have hemostatic uh, agents in them that is going to um, occlude blood to a certain degree. Uh, but saying that there that anyone could use them is is not exactly accurate. And I, and I caught kind of the tail end of of uh, Randy going into some of the compounds, chitosin, and everything that goes into um, uh, into the. Uh, Cellox specific, and then they have ones with and, and, and ones without or products without. Assuming that a, a person wouldn't be allergic or have any type of uh, allergy or reaction to uh, that particular uh, hemostatic agent, I, I think would be a little um, a little presum presumptuous. Um, it, you know, with the chitosin, if, if, if there's any existing allergy to any type of shellfish or anything like that, then the individual would or should uh, know that, you know, prior to any type of uh, any type of exposure, if, if that's going in the direction that the, that, the, that the question was intended. Yeah. Um, um, well, let, let me throw something in there on the caveat, though. Um, I did. I told you I got to do I, I, I ran two uh, clinics where we actually studied uh, this in a surgical setting with untrained personnel. And this was when the Cellox powder was the, the, was the only thing out there with uh, the quick clot. And what we found was the non-trained person that used a chitosin based application. So whether it was the gauze, the powder, um, but chitosin, they had a 98% success rate on hemorrhage control. That was just in our study group. And I think it was only like maybe 48 people. Um, but these were non-medical trained personnel that we, we brought them in. We showed them how it worked on a mannequin. And then we let them do it on a real bleeding thing. And um, the people that only used uh, regular gauze, they had, theirs was only in the 70%. So there was a significant increase in, in hemorrhage control with, with the, the hemostatic agent. Um, but once we showed it how to pack after that, when we went and showed them again, how to actually pack a wound. And once they knew how to pack a wound, they were 100% successful without any hemostatic agent. So again, I think this really, what it goes back to is, is not whether or not combat gauze is right for everyone or chitosin's right for everyone. I think what it comes down to is that if you haven't been trained on the proper application for it, then you don't know how to use it. And my experience is that combat gauze comes in contact with the blood before it gets to the actual vessel that's bleeding. And in that process, because it's just a powder on a, in a gauze impregnated uh, pouch. So once that powder is washed off, again, people are, they, they feel that they've, they've packed this thing in there and it's gonna do its magic now. And again, it's not doing the magic, it's, it's, uh, it's all pressure. You don't have pressure, you don't get hemorrhage control. So it really doesn't matter which of the two agents you use. And again, to date, to date, zero, uh, shellfish allergy, shellfish allergies to chitosan. So I don't know. I hope that helps. Yeah. You know, what Randy said, as far as the, um, I, th I think people associate it with being like the magic powder or the, uh, you know, the magic, uh, hemostatic agent, whether it's in the granular form or whether it's in, um, uh, in impregnated into the, the combat guys, it's he said it. It's the wound packing. It's the ability to properly, uh, properly wound pack, and occlude that um, uh, the 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 flow through the blood vessels, and all the way down into the uh, the depth of of the wound. Uh, you know, it, people people may think that wound packing is just shoving gauze into a hole, but it's it, it's not. There's uh, 
you know, medical professionals, um, uh, whether they be uh, from EMT all the way or first responder all the way up to a paramedic, uh, understand the importance of uh, proper packing skills. And it's something that, you know, Randy, I'm sure you've done countless hours of wound packing. Um, and, and, and I have too. I mean, if you, <laughs> we, we had a little training, uh, training aid for wound packing that really tested the dexterity of, um, uh, of your fingers. And if you could wound pack into this, you could wound pack into anything properly. Uh, we'd take a yoga block, purchased like a yoga block off of, uh, off of Amazon and, uh, made several puncture, uh, puncture wounds and uh, started wound packing or practice wound packing down into that rock, uh, into the yoga block. And obviously that's much more rigid than uh, soft human tissue. Uh, however, if you can wound pack down into that adequately, then uh, you, can, you can wound pack into just about, just about anything out there. Um, so it's, you know, I think the same thing was associated with like the old uh, quick clot, uh, the, the granular powder when it first came out. Um, unless someone had done and this is with the original formula unless someone had done some type of live tissue training they would not have gotten to see or unless they had done it for real they wouldn't have the knowledge of seeing what that agent actually does to um uh soft tissue uh it's it's it might be stopping the bleeding but the the follow-on damage to that soft tissue was what was significant that's that's obviously why they made why some changes were made there but you know if someone's bleeding it, it needs to be assessed to what level they're bleeding at what volume that they're bleeding out and you know again going back to the basics of direct pressure um and attempting to occlude that blood through direct pressure whether it's uh with the hands or whether it's with a uh with a tourniquet or in going into that wound packing process and, and executing proper wound packing until that blood uh, that blood is occluded and that trauma channel is um, is is stopped bleeding. Yeah, awesome. Um, I love the yoga block idea. Somebody commented that, or uh, <laughs> Randy's sister loves the yoga block idea. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but really, any any styrofoam object. You can put a hole in it and start stuffing shit into it, and uh, you, can. Yep. you can start maybe by doing some rice drills with your hands to toughen your fingers up a bit because you're probably going to get sore hands after that. Right. Uh, I can't say that I came up with that myself. I had heard it somewhere, so I was like, you know, I'll be, as as you guys know, the some of the training devices out there that are far more realistic and can actually measure the depth of uh, of wound packing. And it can simulate uh, several different uh, trauma channels. Um, it'll tell you, you know, whether you're doing effective wound packing or not. Uh, and it's much more pliable, realistic uh, tissue feeling um, substance. However, these things are like ridiculously expensive, like five, six thousand dollars just for a wound packing trainer. When you know we can go out and find something that's fairly and even field expedient. You know, I'm I'm all about being able to find something in my environment around me and, and having my guys be like, hey, uh, today we're gonna we got some time. We're gonna freaking practice wound packing. So that's you know what, and that's a commonality amongst trainers everywhere though is the ability to to find something and make something work for training or outside of its intended purpose. Right. I think every single one of us has done that in some way, shape, or form whether you're making some type of um, training knife out of any type of material you can imagine. Although, yeah. like you said, something for medical purposes. Um, I know Randy and I were talking before about, you know, when we're, we're talking decompression needles, I mean, nothing works better than a, a rack of ribs. Yep. Randy, Randy we've proven that quite a few times. Uh, I mean, we were in a course out in uh, Wisconsin and, uh, one of our more recent courses and we got to that point in, a, in the FTX final training exercise and obviously we had been doing uh, round robin stations on it uh, and we got to that point and the the patient was told to exhibit signs and symptoms of uh, tension pneumothorax and obviously um, the individual had suffered a, a GSW uh, went through the whole thing and, you know, Randy had his rack of ribs and his dump pouch. And it, when it came time, you know, we're like, all right, get the needle, get everything prepped. And the, the students kind of looking up at us like, all right, I'm not really dropping a dart on, the, on this guy, am I? And uh, at the last second, Randy pulls out his rack of ribs. He's like, here you go, do it. And, you know, 
while obviously it's it's not the same um, uh, an anatomy, there you can still go um, uh, two three ribs down or second between second and third intercostal space, mid clavicular line, and drop that needle on a rack of ribs, and you'll be as close to anatomic as you can get without actually dropping a needle on a person or a live uh, a live patient. Um, there's a question here that came up. Um, just curious what your thought is on the X stat. Oh, Randy. Uh, <laughs> um, well, you'll know, have to excuse me. The, I believe X stat is the um, the pellets in yes. the, the pen applicator, correct? Right. No. Um, so from I haven't personally used it in wound packing. Uh, I've read a lot about it. I've talked to people that have actually used it in the real world. Um, what they have told me is that it's effective, but you have to get it in deep. You have to have practiced the application, putting the uh, applicator in and then pushing the pellets down in. Because again, if they don't get down to the bleed to where the bleed is actually occurring at, um, they're going to just create a cavity. And so, and, and they swell tremendously. I, yeah. I get that. Um, and that's what they're designed to do. But they, from from what I've been told, not firsthand, but from what I've been told from guys that I believe, um, other SF medics, that if you get it all the way in to the bleeder before you push those uh, pellets in, it, and then you wrap it, it's effective. So uh, I have I have had experience with it uh, fairly recently, not as the uh, instructor, but as a student, and this was during um, uh, some live tissue training. Uh, what Randy had mentioned about getting the um, getting the applicator down into the wound channel is extremely accurate. Um, I'm not sure who that one is made by. The one that uh, the one that I have is actually made by Cellox. Uh, they have a much narrower one that, in appearance, would look about uh, I'd say the diameter of maybe a seven six two or something like that. So getting it into especially the other one that you showed getting that into the wound channel of like say a nine millimeter hole or something uh might might be challenging i know with the cellox uh version it was it was it was challenging this was uh this was a simulation um during a live tissue lab that's the one right there this is a simulation where it was a live patient with a uh, nine millimeter um nine millimeter wound and um it was it was a challenge getting it getting it in as the uh, as the proctors of the instructors were giving guidance when you think that it's deep enough into the wound channel you need to apply a slight bit more pressure to ensure that it is all the way at the depth of the wound channel and then as you uh, as you use the applicator slowly back out until so that the pellets can form into the entire wound channel mm. All right. But All a great, right. great piece of kit. I didn't even know that existed until. So the other thing I think that you know what also works really well. So go ahead. And it's uh, way cheaper. Turkey baster. Tampon. Oh, oh right. yeah. Well, so but we'll just throw one more caveat in there on the X stat because I just pulled it up and, and did a quick review also. Um, it's designed for inguinal bleeds. Uh, so armpit slash. Uh, groin region. Um, and if you know about inguinal bleeds, uh, they have a problem with, because of all the space down in there, how much blood can you fit in the, in the abdomen of the human body? The correct answer is all of it. So what you're trying to do here in the abdomen region, because you can't physically pack the abdomen. So if you get a, a, a femoral bleed down in an inguinal region, around the lower abdomen, um, putting those in there is going to expand them so that they get pressure inside the pelvic cavity, hopefully. Um, if you can get it into that pelvic cavity, that's gonna help to push down on that. Um, if you know anything about uh, the, the, the first guy that we lost in the Gulf War, Nate Chapman, um, that's exactly what happened to Nate was that he took one through the hip and it severed there. And then the femoral, the femur had retracted in, and the medic there was just unable to. I mean, everything he did. Nate lived for quite some time. Um, he, he was medevaced and then passed. So uh, 
And that was before any of this had come out. They didn't have junctional tourniquets yet. They didn't have the XSTAT. And, yeah. and so the junctional tourniquet and the XSTAT are directly addressing uh, what do we do for these these just one in a million inguinal bleeds that that happen that if we had something, could we have put it in there? Um, but I'm also going to throw the caveat in the XSTAT is something that a medic's only going to carry in a larger aid bag, probably like a vehicle bag. <clears throat> they carry something like that. I, I wouldn't personally have carried the XSTAT in my personal bag on my back. Um, I would have kept that in my vehicle, but I had other other options. So, but does that does that help clarify? I guess. I would and, not know. Brian, if there, that answers your question, then let us know. And adding on there on junctional on junctional bleeds, uh, specific like as far as like abdominal and and Randy, I'll get you to add in on this if you've had the experience. Um, uh, you have your you have your aorta. I believe it's called the aortic tourniquet. Um, I know some uh, some soft teams are are used are using those and or have tested uh, tested them. Um, I have not personally used one. Um, I've seen one used in training. Uh, I the feedback that I have received is that there is a limited amount of value versus how large uh, the tourniquet is itself, uh, especially for any type of military uh, application or uh, long range reconnaissance team or anything like that. Uh, it, it's quite large. And I guess the, the, the weight and mobility of it weighs against the success rate that it has uh, for actually stopping um, that, you know, certain types of junctional bleeds. Correct. I got an image for you. I'll pull it up here real fast. Just give me a second. I'm not as uh, quick on the draw as I should be here, but let me see what I can get for you guys. There's some decent videos out there on it too. Yeah, I, I didn't. I didn't know what to expect. So here's one with it on a person. Yep. Yeah. And then I think I got another one here. Let's see if I can get an actual, just straight image of it. Um, two seconds. Not as fast as I should be. There we go. Um, so yeah, I mean, is there anything else when it comes to like you guys said? There's there's that nice to have kit versus the like essential kit. And, right. and Randy talked on that earlier um, about you know if you had an IFAC or you have a throw bag or something like what is going in that versus you know what are the things that you maybe don't need or can be in some type of um secondary or tertiary treatment right. application and you know to speak to that in, in our in our previous uh video that we did for the uh for the summit you know and just going the value of going through an ifac or or an als bag and we showed both of those components you know one being the ifac how small it is how compact but having the with the confined space, having the items in there that are going to be most useful uh, to support that march algorithm um, versus, you know, having the luxury of an ALS bag, uh, a full on like the ALS bag that I showed and the components in it. Uh, that's going to be that, you know, again, depending upon your mission set, that's going to be a lot uh, for for, again, a long range, any type of long range reconnaissance team or um, inland uh, special operation. And that's speaking towards the military. You know, working with law enforcement as much as we do, um, I can't. And Randy, again, you can you can interject here, but I can't see the need for, like, say, a junctional tourniquet, aortic tour tourniquet for frontline EMS uh, or for SWAT, just because of the availability to that higher level of uh, that higher level of care. Um, you know, and and again, it's just weighing what you need versus what you want, and I think that's a big thing. You know. Medics, we're we're like anyone else, you know, with, with within the scope of gear. Yeah, we get enamored by whiz bang things that uh, the newest thing that's out there. However, it might not be, it might not work the best. It might not be the most practical. Uh, just speaking to that, I have, I get sent um, gear quite often to do reviews on, and and I'm very candid and and, and very honest uh, if it works or if it doesn't, uh, you know. I forget the name of the company it was C something C tourniquet. Anyhow, it was a ratchet style tourniquet that was like a cuff and um, it designed obviously for arms, uh, lower arms. It, this thing would never fit around a person's leg. And so I had it actually, and I told them what it was that it had been sent to me. 
and uh, that we were just going to give it a test during the d during a training session. And right in front of these guys, they looked at it, and I I ratcheted down. The thing was plastic for one, which com just completely all plastic mechanisms ratcheted it down and it the string i guess inside that turns it which it was a string not cable it snapped on like the third or fourth turn and i literally took and threw it over my shoulder and i was like never use that again and then i went and picked it up and i was like no actually i'm going to keep this in the wrapper and i'm going to take this to show you know what what not to use it's it it, it just doesn't work and um i'm pretty passionate about that as it, from a stand from a standpoint of um I'd rather go with a I'd rather go with a belt or an improvised tourniquet before I would something that I've wasted critical time uh, uh, during the hemorrhage process of of getting the the blood stopped versus using something that is just it's ridiculous and it's kind of gimmicky. So test your kit. Yeah. Well, I think this kind of goes back to that our topic. I think our first question um, we were just discussing why the the Thames program. Uh, the has, T, yeah, the why the TECC program isn't s picking one specific or a group. It's not recommending them. Right, and and again, it, it falls back to those different those those. Uh, so if you have the perfect tourniquet and it does everything, now if we change that tourniquet um, to meet some other requirement, like again, typically it's size that I've seen people try to to make them smaller narrower lighter so that they can fit them in more compact places uh, I, i've uh i'm just going to go ahead and tell the story I, I taught um a class in tacoma to uh, two classes in tacoma to uh the marshals u.s marshals and in one of the classes <laughs> i told the guys i was like you got to carry your tourniquet you've got to put it on and, and they all came up to me like well i gotta go undercover i gotta do this i'm like you know, I gave them three options, showed them the options. They didn't necessarily like it, but a couple of them nodded their head. Okay, see where you're going with it. The next year I came back to teach the second class. And that same, one of the guys came back to my class. And I taught the class, said the same thing again. And then he walked up and he says, and I'm just going to let you know. And he goes through the whole story. He, uh, he went to serve a warrant, walked up on the porch, had left his tourniquet in the car. Guy opened the door, shot him on the porch, closed the door. He fell over. And he said he couldn't, he was like, I, I was, he goes, I didn't have a radio. <laughs> I didn't have anything. He goes, I was undercover with my sidearm and that was it. Everything else was in the car. And he goes, I was literally just laying there going, God, Randy just told me two days ago to put that on my belt. And um, so I think you just have to look at what, what your need is and you have to really find it, find a place to put it. The two that are recommended are for a reason. Uh, and the biggest reason is that from the smaller ones that you see out there, and we've done this in live tissue medical study on cadavers. So I got to take part in that too um, through the University of Minnesota. Um, we did studies on cadavers and they measured, the science department came in and uh, they measured how deep these narrower tourniquets would cut down through muscle, muscle tissue. And it devitalizes muscle tissue very fast if it's not an inch or wider. Um, so you really want to look at the commercial ones available that are proven because they meet all those requirements. Uh, and I told you I did my master's, my thesis on the tourniquet and uh, what the, the Committee on Tactical Combat and Casualty Care and the American College of Surgeons showed in every one of their studies was that um, uh, less than 90%, so it's in the 80s, but less than 90% a civilian paramedics in the United States were able to apply an effective improvised tourniquet on their first attempt in testing. Hmm. Let that let that sink in for a second. That's a that's a that's a big number. So improvised tourniquets by the untrained by sorry by the trained medical provider are not effective. So again, this goes back to why we want a, a commercial grade because. We have to stop the bleeding coming coming down from the heart, right? And a lot of people, I think, screw up in that they're try they try to be nice and not put the tourniquet on tight, or they they don't know. And it has to be all the way down as tight as you until the bleeding stops. So if you use North American Rescue Cat tourniquet, it says to apply the Velcro 
as tight as you can get it. And when I tell people that, it means if you can put a finger under the Velcro after you've tightened it, it's too loose. You have to tighten it. I say ratchet it down before you Velcro it. Yeah. So it has to be tight. And if you use that, that measurement, the finger, before you start to turn, you turn it three times, they guarantee hemorrhage control every single time. I will tell you that when I put these on real people in real bleeding situations, that I was able to get hemorrhage control at two turns. But did I put that third turn on? Damn right, because that's what the instructions said. <laughs> <laughs> Follow the instructions. Listen around. But yeah, <laughs> but yeah so it, it really comes down to uh, is it effective on the body? And then is it damaging the body? And anything that's narrower than an inch produces uh, a cutting force and, and can really hurt m muscle tissue tr tremendously. So, And, you know, the, obviously there's a huge difference here in the methodology between uh, frontline medicine, uh, EMS, and um, uh, wilderness medicine. And I, I can speak to that because I'm a wilderness EMT. Um, and also, obviously, military military uh, medicine, and I and I say that. And as an example, kind of speaking to that, it I, when I went through my my wilderness um, EMT pipeline, uh, my uh, lead instructor was a, a former former uh, PJ, uh, great guy, and he knew my background. And uh, so when we got to the tourniquets, and there was a whole span of other. Uh, individuals, you know, within the class from age range and everything, uh, career fields, so on and so forth. And he knew he knew ahead of time how I was going to uh, how I was going to mitigate it, and he kind of set me up just to get a chuckle out of me because he also knew that the instructor that was leading that portion was a more of a frontline EMS guy. So he, he kind of set me up, but anyhow, he he gave me the example of um, uh, that he had a bleed a bleed below an arterial bleed below the elbow. And, um, and so, you know, I just said, I'm going to obviously ensure that the scene is safe. Uh, and I'm going to apply direct pressure and I'm going to go ahead and run a tourniquet all the way up junctional and to the armpit, to the top of the arm, as far as I can go. And, uh, and, you know, the instructor looked at me and he's like, what, what, what are you doing? He's like, I don't want to lose, I'm, I'm, I don't want to lose my whole arm. And, uh, I, I looked at him and I was like, all right. He's like, all right, well, just just continue. And so I said, OK, well, I'll continue. Just make sure that you tell me how, how you want me to do it. And so he's like, all right, now what would you do? And I said, well, I would assess to ensure that I've stopped the bleeding uh, if the bleeding has not stopped or if I know that there is a period of time lapse to get to a higher level of care, I may back that up with another tourniquet just under it. And he's like, I'm definitely going to lose my arm now. And, and, you know, again, that's not necessarily the case. And of course, for that scenario, because I am at the time I was in a um, wilderness and, and out, it would be a, the situation would be a, a wilderness outback type situation. Um, my thought is, it's going to be a delayed amount of time to the higher level of care. And I know that T triple C, uh, I'm not going to say they default to running the second tourniquet, but it's it's usually it's usually applied depending upon the severity of the bleed and also depending upon um, for military purposes where that dust off or where that uh, medevac um, location might be or if one exists at all. And that second tourniquet is just backing up to make sure that the first one's doing its job and to make sure that that movement, especially on lower extremities on legs that that's not going to slip down and we're going to have to, we're either going to lose blood or we're going to have to stop momentum or movement to adjust, uh, to adjust the tourniquet, which I might add, obviously we do want to continue to check the patient uh, regularly, check their, uh, check their vitals and check and make sure that the tourniquets are still doing exactly what we, uh, what we want them to do. Now, frontline EMS would say that, you know, it would be one to two inches above uh, the wound site. Uh, the tourniquet goes on, and and, and then we reassess, re recheck accordingly. So um, th those are just two different, you know, kind of schools of thought. And it doesn't mean that either are wrong, but there's different medicine for, you know, for different applications. I, and you guys might have already talked about this, and, and I really harp on tourniquets because of their importance. They're so simple but so effective. Um, you know, the 
a lot of the fear factor associated with tourniquets is, oh, well, I'm going to lose that limb. And that's just not, that's not always, that's not always the case at all. Um, and in that type of situation, especially if we are dealing with, and this is speaking to our military crowd and speaking to even possibly some of our wilderness medics, SAR medics, things of that sort, uh, as they probably already know, um, the hemorrhages, the hemorrhaging is going to, the blood loss is going to kill you, um, losing, you know, possibly losing a, a part of the appendage from it dying is 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 going to kill you a whole lot slower than than that blood loss would. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's a few questions on here, and I want to I want to cover these real quick. I'm not sure exactly what this one is referencing, but he said uh, Gavin said problem in Australia is we really don't have heart medics. Um, we might have to wait for next level care in a safe zone. So. Uh, do you guys know what uh, the HART medic is? Um, double checking, but I, I don't want to talk out of. <laughs> I'm a, I'm, um, I, my assumption would be some type like a specialized, um, like a specialized. Are we talking like a Thames, like a Thames medic, maybe? I, I believe so. Just, uh, the, just in Australia, they they call it different. Um, go ahead, I'll let one of you guys take this. So can you pop the question up one more time? Sorry. Sure. Just, well, it's, uh, it's not so much a question, it's more so, of a statement. So they saying that they have to wait for that next level of care in a safe zone. So because okay. yeah. more of that wilderness scenario sure. where they're out, you know, out somewhere in the wilderness sure. and now they have there's a significant amount of distance between them and next level of care. Now that that's that's completely understandable. Um, you know, again, the, the first thing would be to be to have training or experience in that in in that arena um you know in working with uh some of the other wilderness medics and, and good friends with with a lot of them um a lot of things need to be taken into consideration there i literally one of the guys that i just that i graduated the uh the wilderness uh, emt course with we just did a, a summit of rainier here in washington and I, I would just put out there straight up that I'm I'm not I'm not a mount I'm not a mountaineer. It was, it was one of my one of my first experiences, and so my medical mind I was thinking, okay, this could happen, this could happen, this could happen. Um, you know, we need this, we need that, and you know, when we did our gear check the night before, he's slinging stuff over his shoulder left and right. He's like, nope, not taking that. Nope, not taking that. They have a saying, um, ounces equals pounds and pounds equal pain. And so I know a lot of the viewers can, can relate to that. Um, the, the key critical things there were the ability to communicate. Um, I know we took the, uh, the Garmin inReach device with us that not only is uh, active tracking of our location and route, you uh, the, obviously the Garmin is communicating with the satellite um you can have any individual anywhere monitor your route at any given time but the great thing about that device is that it has an sos on it and you can depress that sos and that is part of the package that you that you get with that service is uh they're going to send an air unit to your location for a medical uh a medical evac you can also text with it as well again not being um not trying to be too much of a, a gear guy because it is an electronic device. And as we know about any electronic devices, they can fail when you, when you need them most. But in that austere type outback situation, I would, I would highly recommend that as a absolute necessity to establish and have constant communication with that higher level of care. Um, obviously a satellite phone would come into play uh, outside of that from the medical standpoint of it, making sure that you have a you know a loadout in that environment that can address each of the major things within the march algorithm march algorithm the major hemorrhage um the you know the airway respirations um circulation and uh um hypothermia it, especially in in australia where you can have such uh, vast swings in uh, in climate you know we can we can go into the um into dialogue about shock and you know People talk about how fast uh, bleeding out uh, can can kill you. Shock can kill you just as just as fast, if not faster. Uh, so it's 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 a key consideration, uh, and and it needs to be weighed out. Just like with my my uh, example of going up on uh, Rainier, you have to weigh out what you need, as I said before, versus what you want. 
Um, I, again, in my mind, I had uh, I had IV bags, I had freaking starter kits. I had. He's like, no, man. He's like, if we need this, then we're you know we're gonna call for that um, that that SAR evac now. If you don't have, uh, you know, in Australia, if you don't have the luxury of um, of that technology or or something that is similar or compatible, then you are going to have to, you know, consider uh, the weight versus um, the survivability as far as you know carrying your own fluids with you. Obviously, being able to having the training and the uh, so on and so forth to be able to push fluids, and also you know your hemorrhage control with things to treat any type of hypothermia and, and whatnot. Uh, the thing about Australia is, is that there's just so many things that can kill you. You guys got some of the, you know, the deadliest freaking snakes and animals out, out there in, in, in the world. So I, I can definitely understand where there's concern there. There was, uh, Gavin just made a quick call. Oh yeah, go ahead, buddy. What's up? Oh, I, I saw his comment. So, and yeah. I kind of listening to JB, I, I think I started going down the same uh, line Gavin was looking for. So, um, yeah, go ahead. It, it was something that I, I, I mentioned earlier. So I'll talk about it real quick. And then I'm going to ask you to pull that PDF I sent you on sure. the level of care. Yeah. Uh, if, if we can, Adam, but not right yet. So <clears throat> what it comes down to, Gavin, is um, so this is coming from my counter terrorist days where we had to go uh, as, a, as a tactical medic. We had to move from our position forward into the danger. And you're never allowed to break that seal, right? As a medic, you're not allowed to go over there. Uh, and in, in civilian medicine, I know there's a lot more restrictions. So I'm sorry, I can't speak to that. But even in the, in the military world, we have safety precautions and things like this. And I, and really what that comes down to is it's, it's not just the safety of the medic, it, that, uh, it's the safety of the medic going into an unknown environment. And then the people in there worrying that everything coming at them with a gun is a hostile and Correct. So you have to have that delay to make sure that everybody that's in there that's a shooter knows that that medic's coming. Now, in the military, we did it a lot faster than in typical law enforcement. But I listened to the podcast. Uh, you'll have to refresh me. I don't I think it was a week ago, two weeks ago. Tim Kennedy was on it. It was the active shooter one. Yeah, it was the, what, the round table we did on active shooter. That was it. So I was listening to that and, and I listened to the whole, everybody talked about all the different responses in medicine. And what interested me was that nobody said, nobody described the system that we used in the military. And, and I found it to be interesting because uh, again, just like the question stated was that you have to wait in that secondary zone until you're called into the danger zone, right? Um, and so what do you need in the danger zone before if, if you've got to be in that danger zone, what do you need to, to stabilize a patient is what I've heard. What do you need to stabilize a patient in that danger zone before that medic can get up, right? Before they can go. And again, it falls back to the, the IFAC and level of training. And um, if you pop that slide up right now, I think this is where I, I could talk about that real fast. Sure. So that, yeah, give me a second. Yeah. Um, I also had um, I I don't think Mike Dr. Mike Simpson is going to be able to join us, but I did a two two episode, um, I did a two episode uh, podcast on him on tactical medicine, and we talked a lot about primary care and then secondary and tertiary locations. And what is your responsibility, like especially if you're if you're talking about like a terrorist attack, if there's an active shooter. Mm -hmm. As with anything, your number one priority is to win the firefight. <laughs> like, that's it, right? And if, if someone shot, it's their responsibility to get that. If they have a tourniquet, get it on yourself, right? Well, like your buddy's exactly. dragging you or moving to us undercover, but you're still returning around. So that's your number one priority. Um, and then what he had mentioned was all of the other part of March that we talked about mm -hmm. from A down can be handled in a secondary location. Yes. So that's, and that's a key component is realizing that if that's the case and that person is in that really bad spot, that massive hemorrhage is the first thing that you can take care of on the one spot, but that's it. Everything else, it gets moved back to that, to the medic or to the secondary location. So um, we talked a lot about that in that one episode. Yeah. So, and this is, this is the topic that's really important and kind of near and dear to our heart with Contra Group because it's something that we're, 
we're trying to affect. You know, obviously not the only providers in the uh, in the game that are uh, trying to affect in this way. However, you know, a lot of a lot of my cadre, we come from a military background, and with that, with a lot of the teams uh, that we've worked with, we have that medic integrated into our team. So that medic is uh, is a shooter. Um, that medic was probably well. I'm the, the medic was trained as a shooter before he became a medic, and a lot of times with so you have two, um, you know, two situations within law enforcement. Either they're using EMS on the outside of the uh, crisis site or on the outside corridor of the crisis site, um, and then the team that's inside on the crisis site actively engaged with securing it they are responsible for their own self aid and or buddy aid which may be you know which may be limited with all, with the other kit that they're carrying um and that ems element is not allowed to come into that crisis site until it's until it's secure and so obviously they know that pro that poses a, a large concern and in, in in certain situations situations a life-threatening um uh, a life-threatening situation for those for those SWAT officers or those responding officers. Um, and you know, most of the people that are watching the, the 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 program, they may not be policymakers that can say, hey, you know, well, the, tomorrow we need to start training our own our own shooters uh, as uh, as medics and have have the medic integrated into the team as a shooter. Uh, while you may not you know be able to do that, I know that some teams are training the uh the medics um in the skill sets and the tactics and movement of the SWAT team but they're non-shooters they're basically what we consider in the in the military non-combatants they're, they're not carrying a weapon they're just at the back of back of the stack um my comment to that is good for you buddy you you got more balls than i do because if i'm going into a firefight um or if i'm being sent into a firefight without a boomstick I'm not going to be very happy about it, especially being, you know, being the medic. But I understand, I understand that from the point of there, there's this situation that exists with not having it interior to the crisis site and the need for it being there. And so that's where, you know, with Contra Group, we try to bridge that gap by not affecting policy, obviously, but training the law enforcement officer and the SWAT officers at a higher level of first responder care up to and including uh, treatment of tension pneumothorax, um, uh, GSWs, uh, blood control, things of that sort, hemorrhage control. Um, we're training them at these higher levels and also giving them the ability to utilize their tactics and their response uh, in conjunction with those tactics. So a lot of times, you know, when you go to a course that is a TAC med course, you're spending, you know, the first day or maybe half a day, two days, who knows, in uh, didactic instruction, PowerPoint, PowerPoint instruction, call it PowerPoint by death. You go into your round robins and then there is like maybe a, a culminating exercise. But a lot of times that does not involve that doesn't involve the tactics that doesn't involve the um, uh, auditory exclusion of gunshots around you. That doesn't involve the, you know, the, the fight or flight that, that Grossman talks about uh, and all of the components of Cooper's color codes that we know affect our ability to make decisions in these high stress situations. What we do is with Contra Group, with our, our Apex course, is we bring it from that didactic instruction up to the round robins and then we go into scenarios where they are using their you know they're using live ammo or we're utilizing sim munitions and so now we're getting all of those other elements and you know one of the first live scenarios that we run with each team it's usually it's it's usually a yard sale and we we kind of expect it to be because we're throwing a lot at them at one time um, what we generally see with those scenarios is we see students getting mud sucked and mud sucked uh, military slang, basically getting sucked into the fight, sucked into the firefight and not even recognizing that one of their teammates are down. Situation is going to dictate. So within that environment, whether, you know, whether it be SWAT or a military operation, it does us no good not to eliminate the threat or 
to leave the threat and go to the patient and now we both become patients. However, there are situations where that doesn't, that isn't exactly true. Um, a lot of the situations that we set up for them were linear and they were receiving contact from the front and then one of their teammates would go down online with them. And our whole focus for these drills was two things and we've already kind of touched on that, was to be able to identify that and now if we need to effectively move back or bound back to cover to have number one, the command and control to identify and deliver uh, accurized fire at or onto that target or threat that's shooting at us, but to also be able to effectively bound um, back to a position of cover to where we can now treat, uh, treat this patient. Um, going forward of that, going out onto the, the kill box, kill zone, X, whatever you want to call it, to get a patient while we're, you know, taking accurate fire is, is, is not the prescribed, prescribed method because now we're looking at potentially two patients. So in, in that process of inundating them with the, you know, the auditory, um, we're using different, uh, different devices. We call them um, uh, jam sticks or whatever. We're causing... Uh, malfunctions and stoppages with their primary and secondary weapons, whatever they're using. So now they have that to deal with. And all of this is a building block process all the way up until the end, uh, the final exercise to where now they've seen several of these uh, training scenarios. They've, they've had the medicine, um, they've had the didactic instruction, they've had the round robins, they know how to do wound packing, they know how to drop a needle, and, I'll, and I'm gonna come back to that in a second. They know how to do all of these things and now we're throwing the kitchen sink at them. So we have scenarios, and I know there's other uh, training providers out there that do the same thing. Uh, we're very heavy, especially on our final exercises with moulage. We incorporate a large amount of moulage. And in the medic world, uh, most of you know, we're just using that as an a distractor. One of the best distractors in that case would be an, uh, an evisceration. Uh, for a common person to see an evisceration for the first time, the, the focus is, can very likely be on that and the, the unsightliness of that. But the ability, and generally with those scenarios, we'll have some type of major bleed and see if we can get that evisceration to be a distractor to that major arterial bleed that they should be addressing immediately. On top of that, we're still jamming their weapons and several of the uh, team members, we have now taken their, uh, their um, primary or their support hand out of the fight by taping it up around a wiffle ball or something like that. So now they're having to uh, simulate fighting with one hand uh, with their primary weapon. Um, they're having to do command and control. They're having to make decisions on the X while we're inducing that auditory exclusion of you know yelling at them, using bullhorns and trying to get them to make a decision that might not be the right decision. Um, depending upon the situation, you know, maybe you're just compromised in the area that you are and you need to get your team and that patient back to a secure area. Obviously just grabbing the patient and running is not the prescribed uh, method, especially if we can't positively identify where this threat is coming from. And again, right there with that, we enter into the different realms between military and law enforcement. In military, um, if we had the assets available and it was that type of situation where we couldn't positively ID um, and we could stabilize that patient in the immediate area, we're just going to do a call for fire strike on that building or wherever that's coming from. And now a, you know, um, a half block or a block is going to disappear. Obviously, EMS doesn't have that capability. So their ability to think outside of the box use terrain, use micro terrain to effectively maybe gain a position of advantage, even if it is back and not toward the threat, uh, then the ability to do that. Um, and it's, it, it's a process where when they look at it in hindsight and the last evolution is, uh, is generally it's, it's the best. And they're like, you know, we don't feel like we could have effectively done that this first, you know, the first time that we went through just because of all of the different variables that were compounded versus just going through didactic and going through round robin uh, situations. So just kind of circle that back around to, you know, originally um, with the question about having the limit being limited by EMS being on the outer corridor and uh, um, the, the team on, inside of the crisis site, you know, there, there are training uh, solutions out there that train the team members 
to a level that incorporate their own tactics where um, the shooters, even in the absence of a paramedic, could do a whole lot to, to affect um, the survivability of that patient. One thing I do want to talk about real quick, and, and I'll uh, jump, off the, jump off the mic and open up for another question, is so in that you may have heard me say, um, you know, teaching officers or SWAT officers um, uh, needle decompression intervention on tension pneumothorax. Well, you know, that's generally along the guidelines of a paramedic and would be considered out of the scope of work for uh, other than a paramedic. Um, or higher. In none of our instruction do we say, this is what you need to do. This is what you should do. Uh, we're not encouraging any department or any officer or any trainee for that matter to operate or function outside of their scope of work. But we're gonna, you know, this is real talk. And I, I'm talking from a standpoint of, if I was just a basic first responder and I had been through a course that showed me and I had had follow on training on um, recognizing the signs and symptoms of tension pneumothorax. And I knew that my teammate, my brother, had a narrow window of survivability and something as simple as me correctly uh, applying intervention with uh, needle decompression could save his life. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do that. And I'm going to have to, you know, I'm going to have to answer to whomever afterwards if, if they want to, uh, they want to critique me for that. So that's going to end up being at the discretion of that uh, officer or the, or, or the operator. Myself, I would much rather be armed with the knowledge to be able to intervene to save uh, a brother's life versus sitting there and watching them die in front of me because of something that could have been, uh, that, that could have been uh, intervened in and could have saved their life. Yeah, real quickly. That's super awesome. Real Randy, real quick. I queued this up because I, I knew this was coming. I actually have a uh, the, the Apex promo video. Hang on. Hey. Let's see if I can add this in here. Breaking news from overnight, an Albuquerque police officer shot during a traffic stop. Fellow officers, as you can see in the video, dragged him to safety with the help of a civilian. New developments in the shooting of a police officer in Southern California. The officer was hit as he responded to a call that an armed man had set a home on fire. When police and fire units respond, they say someone uh, fired several rounds from inside the house. An officer was shot in the neck. Now to some breaking news out of Prince George's County, Maryland. An officer shot outside of a police station today, critically wounded, and some residents pulled to shelter in place. A community near Houston he is remembering the sheriff's deputy murdered this weekend. That breaking news, Norfolk police officer Brian Jones shot and killed on the job last night. Another officer in the hospital. Talking about a creature who is capable of confronting and dealing with combat and sustaining themselves across the long haul. The goal becomes to be a sheepdog, to be a warrior, to be the one that is ready to respond to the threats when the time arises. The man. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> <laughs> I love that video. <laughs> <laughs> um, I got no voice. Yeah, we don't hear you, Adam. I heard myself. There you go. Um, I was going to say, that was um, such a great video. And we could literally take that frame by frame and break down what each of those components are. Um, but like you said, there's there's so much stuff dynamically happening that it, that's so far and apart from what we normally think of when we think of uh, some type of training course. Um, and that's obviously intentional, right? So, uh, but a, a word of caution too, is if you're listening to this and you're an instructor, please do not go out and try to build an extremely dynamic scenario if you've never done it before. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that is a, a uh, no, I for I that. That. It, the, so before we incorporated, before we incorporate any of our elements into um, our training curriculum, we we test it, we evaluate it, 
Um, we get other uh, SMEs uh, to give it the sniff test because you know I, I'm not the definitely not the the, the medic Yoda, um, and, and and there's guys and gals out there that have a whole lot more experience um, or may have more experience than than I do in knowledge. So we put we put these ideas and concepts through a pipeline of um, uh, validation. But even more important than that, after that validation process, we we and we actually uh, execute this training on ourselves. We'll have one of our cadre or one of our instructors come out, and they'll put us through it. Um, and, and a good example of that is, you know, we were sitting around one night, round, you know, round tabling and no pun intended, but you know, just talking about after one of the courses, what you know, what can we do to um, maximize uh, this training towards a level of realism? Because that's what we're always what's what we're always trying to achieve is that next level of realism while maintaining a safe environment for, for the trainee or for the student. And we had come across and, and again, not our concept. I had seen it somewhere else before where uh, one of the students would had their hand taped around a wiffle ball. And, and unless you've done it to take your either uh, dominant or your support hand out of the firefight with an AR it, it's and it's simulating you just don't have the ability you can't open your hand up so now you're having to you having to adjust by laying the weapon over your uh, your forearm or lay it onto an object and pull it tight back into the uh, into the shoulder um, all of those challenges are challenges that we want to address in a training capacity before we ever experience them obviously you can't go out and hack somebody's arm off or something like that so we're going to do these things to try to to try to increase that level of realism. And as I was saying, you know, with that, we did it to ourselves. Everyone on the team experienced it. And then we went out and uh, we built it into, you know, we built it into our curriculum, um, you know, with the moulage, with the with the lighting. Um, we've been on facilities before uh, military installations where we had the luxury. My and my military uh, crowd out there, you probably experienced these as well. Um, one of the best places for this that I've seen is Kasadik, uh, King Abdullah's uh, Special Operations Training Center in uh, Jordan. Um, they have smell simulators. And so you're thinking about all the different ways that you can overload the senses with audio, you know, visual, all of these different things. But to be able to smell something that smells like a rotting corpse or you know, um, a corpse that has been burned and they have all of these things that, that they can in, inject into the environment. And you may think, well, why the heck do, you know, why, as a trainee, why do I need to experience that? Well, especially for SWAT and law enforcement, the, the unknown is the unknown. The building that you're going into, you're not sure how, what's there or how long it's been there. Military, uh, you know, for obvious purposes as well. Um, you know, the first time that I, smell a, a, a rotting corpse or a burning body is not when I, you know, I don't want it to be the, the first time I'm on a direct action or um, some type of a SWAT call up. I would rather, as unpleasant as the thought is, I'd rather experience these things in a training capacity, you know, uh, prior to that. Yeah, that's something real quick. I'm Randy, I'm going to let you go here because uh, hey, no, you're good. JB took up all your time. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> Well, this is something that comes up in almost every talk that we do, um, and it, it because and I don't know why I've, it's literally the last ten of these I've done I've brought this up, but until you actually deal with blood, you don't realize how slippery and just difficult it is to work with, right? Um, and so we've talked a lot about in the previous uh, Q and As and previous sessions and things like that about pre exposure training and getting people exposed to trauma before they actually have to deal with it in real life and how important that is. Um, before we jumped on the call here, uh, Randy and I were, were joking and, and talking about um, Soft's affinity for using live animals, um, which is probably unrealistic for most law enforcement agencies, right? They're not going to be able to do that. But like we've discussed, there's different ways to simulate that. Um, but maybe do we just want, can we just touch on real quickly when we talk from a, a medical perspective or like from a law enforcement perspective, how important it is to at least have some exposure to, to trauma or things like that before actually having to deal with it in a, a life or death situation. So back to what I said at the beginning, where I said, you pick up your brain and you stuff it back in your head. 
and they showed us lots of gory pictures and films in our training to try and speed up that process. Sounds like you've had podcasts on that, that which is cool because it is one of the, the biggest things um, is is the 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 speed that you're going to recover to take care of that. Um, I totally forgot where I was going with that because I got this other thing on my mind. I wanted to talk to Gavin's question about. So okay, sorry. Yeah. I spaced. No, that's good. Let's 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 handle that. What his, which question do you want to? What you so wanna... is that one he was talking about? Where the heart teams? All right. Do you want me to bring that uh, T Tri C thing back up? Yeah. Could you real quick? Just to, uh, this won't take long. I think I can summarize it for him, uh, having thought about it for a bit now. Um, yes. So sir. Once you get that slide up. So if you just scroll just a touch so we can see uh, right there, stop skills. So it says skill, all, CLS, CM, and CPM. And if we look at uh, the key up above, we've got all personnel, essentially all deploying combatants. And then we have the combat lifesaver, uh, the combat medic, and then the combat paramedic. So if I think, Gavin, what you need to do is take something like that forward to your people if they haven't seen something like this and say, we need to designate the levels of care that we have in each zone. And the reason I say this is because, because everybody that goes into the zone, every police officer should be at a minimum uh, of that basic trained right there. But if you go over one step to CLS right there, that's the combat lifesaver. Now scroll down that and look real quick right there in, in the hemostatic dressings, it goes all the way down the same, all the way across for everybody else, all the way until you get to breathing. The difference between a combat lifesaver and just your everybody else trained tactical combat casualty care or tactical emergency casualty care is right there in breathing. If you look, combat lifesavers and forward are allowed to do a needle, a needle thoracostomy. So not only do they treat the sucking chest wound if there's an open chest wound, but now they're allowed to put a needle in it. And what I can tell you is that every single person that goes, that's well, every single person that is on a combat arms level team in the military is required now to have that CLS level when they go in, because you have to be able to give that care up front. And if you look at all the other basics cares, everybody does the same thing. There's only one thing that differentiates the two, and that's the needle. So if moving forward means you're going to have a delay in care in, in your tactical zone, because you got your safe zone, you got your exclusion zone, you got your tactical zone for your heart team, then you have to make sure that everybody forward of that exclusion zone has that CLS level. That's what has to be dictated up front, because if they go into it unprepared, they can't respond. And I understand you don't have tactical medics on a heart team that are going to throw on body armor and do a bunch of crazy uh, room entry stuff to go support the heart team itself. So I think that's the right answer is the levels that individuals have to have need to be dictated prior to the event. And I think this is a great slide for showing that. I hope that helps. I think that may have. Okay. Um, what we'll do too is um, what I'll do. If anybody wants this uh, PDF, um, we'll have it on the actual um, on the website. We'll have make sure it's available to everybody so you guys can download it. And if you go to uh, www.naemt.org and then go up and put in TTRIC, TCCC. Um, all of the training materials for tactical combat casualty care are free and open to the public. So, uh, right there. Randy, you can also add in the chat if you want. You can type those right in there. Oh, can I? Yep. <laughs> yep. Um, I'm just bringing up uh, a, a video here. Jeremy sent me a video. Um, I'm sure any of your viewers already know this, uh, but I'll just I'll add it in there for some that might not. What and what Randy was just saying as far as the NAEMT. Um, that they are the national standard uh, for um, training, uh, stand, training standardization on T tri C, T triple C, and T E C C, or excuse me, tactical emergency um, 
evacuation care or excuse me, tactical emergency uh, casualty care. Uh, they they set the the national standard. So uh, for those that would be interested in becoming instructors for their department, where not only are you uh, getting a certificate yourself, but you would have the ability to go back and train. Uh, it's basically train the trainer and also for accredited hours, uh, you can go through that portal for NAEMT. You can type in T, uh, TCC or you can type in TCCC and it'll take you to uh, their portals where you can uh, you can get that training and, um, and, and be basically be a trainer for your department. Um, this uh, the the video that's queued up now. I had mentioned earlier, you know, we were kind of starting to go down the rabbit hole. And we were talking a whole lot about hemorrhage, um, and then when we started talking, you know, I referenced shock as far as like um, uh, shock how it can happen relative to the H uh, and exposure in March. Uh, however, um, hypovolemic shock can lead, or excuse me, um, mass hemorrhage can lead directly into uh, hypovolemic shock. And I don't think a lot of people have a clear understanding of number one, how much blood volume uh, your body has. And to be able to assess that on the ground is a very difficult thing. Uh, just because of the way that blood coagulates and it pulls, uh, that assessment might be difficult to recognize, especially if there's grass, it's gonna be almost impossible. But if it's on a hard surface, uh, this video, we use it uh, quite often in training as well, it gives a great uh, representation of blood volume, blood volume loss, and basically uh, what's happening to the body uh, in, in these stages of, uh, of blood loss. Awesome. All right, let me cue this up. Bottles represent 1,000 cc of blood, or one liter of blood. At 500 cc of blood loss, middle state is alert. Radio pulse is full. Heart rate is normal, slightly increased. Systolic blood pressure is normal. Respiratory rate is normal. At 1,000 cc's of blood loss, mental state is alert. Radio pulse is full. Heart rate is elevated, 100 plus. Systolic blood pressure is normal when supine. Respiratory rate may be normal. While we watch this video, it's important to remember that you can completely bleed out your entire blood volume in three minutes from a femoral artery bleed. With that being said, you're gonna lose consciousness and the ability to control the bleeding yourself in about 90 seconds. At 1500 cc's of blood loss, mental state is alert but anxious. Radio pulse may be weak. Heart rate is 100 plus. The solid blood pressure may be decreased. Respiratory rate, 30. Two thousand cc's of blood loss. Patient is confused, lethargic. Radio pulse is weak. Heart rate is one twenty plus. So solid blood pressure is decreased. Respiratory rate is greater than thirty five. The average adult has five liters or five thousand cc's of blood circulating in their body. At 2,500 cc's blood loss, patient is unconscious, radio pulse absent, heart rate is 140 plus, so solid blood pressure markedly decreased, respiratory rate over 35. This patient is most likely to die from this amount of blood loss. While we watch the rest of this video, let's talk about shock. Shock is inadequate blood flow to body tissues that lead to inadequate oxygen delivery and cellular dysfunction. The classifications of shock are as follows. Class one is less than 750 cc's or mLs of blood loss. The body is able to perform pretty much normal with this amount of blood loss. Class two shock is represented by 750 to 1500 cc's of blood loss. The body is still able to compensate for this amount of blood loss.
Class 3 shock is represented by 1,500 to 2,000 cc's of blood loss. The body starts decompensating for this amount of blood loss at this mark. Class 4 shock is greater than 2,000 cc's of blood loss. The body is in irreversible shock at this time and is not able to compensate for the amount of blood loss it has sustained. So, Randy, uh, you know, um, your description of, uh, of blood loss in the context of um, once it's gone and how at, at certain points it's how irreversible it is uh, in conjunction with uh, proper hemorrhage control. Can you speak to that just for a second as, as far as, uh, you know, people think that once we lose a certain volume of blood, well, we can just get them to that higher level of care and we can do a blood transfusion, we can do that. But there are there are key critical points and, and phases in that where um, the damage and the loss that's done, it's we, we can't we can't get to that point or we can't get back to where we need to be and how important it is for every single drop of blood that that person loses. You're muted. <laughs> That's everyone. Everyone got it now. Be the good guy and not be loud. <laughs> um, I think it's critical. It's it's absolutely critical. Um, I've 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 I like the water way of explaining it. I've done. I've used that myself before. Um, gosh, I'm trying to think of a, a way to expand upon what you were just saying there, Jeremy. It's just that. Um, Oh, so what I was it, getting ready to say was it, just, I, just a part of like as far as you know with um, I'll, I'll just use uh, the loss of electrolytes for an example. You know we can re and use that as a parallel right. because we can we can replace electrolytes and I think that sometimes people think that blood might be the same way. Well, we can just they have time. We can get them to a higher level of care. Um, they can take care of them there. They can do blood transfusion, whatever. And it's it's just not that way. Right. So so. And I, I have this question a lot. Sorry, and that's what I was trying to get. I just lost my train of thought. Um, when I'm teaching wilderness medicine, uh, wilderness EMT, stuff like that. And and uh, again, it comes back to like you were saying too, Jeremy, about the people believing that if they put a tourniquet on, the, the limbs lost, all this kind of stuff. Um, what, what I've seen from firsthand as well as uh, in training, um, you have to stop the bleeding, period. If you can stop the bleeding, and you have a beating heart, the human body is resilient. It's amazing what it will do. But if you don't stop that bleeding fast enough, um, blood carries one thing that we need, and it, it's oxygen. And if your nugget, your brain, doesn't get the oxygen it needs, then it will die. You can, it, it, the, the, the process of shock as you, you fall through it, it's just the turning off of organs in the order we don't need them, essentially. The problem is, is that when, when shock really becomes an issue in the extended trauma scenario, long-term patient care, is when we get the patient that gets down into the 70s and the 60s on their blood pressure, um, that's really when we start as tactical medics, start kind of losing our stuff. Because somewhere in there is when the kidneys shut off. And once the kidneys are off for a while, they don't start back up very easily. And modern medicine has done a lot to speed that up, but still we, we have to keep the blood flow to the kidneys and the brain. And that happens above uh, 70 systolic. So um, it, stopping bleeding is, is critical. I personally sat on a guy for 18 hours that was unconscious. I had no blood products. Um, I think I only had two, maybe two and a half liters of fluid that I was able to uh, play with a blood pressure on. And we just looked at keeping his systolic blood pressure at 90 uh, over power. Um, so as long as we could keep uh, the top end of that blood pressure right up at 90, we knew that his body was getting enough oxygen. His organs were perfusing. He may have not had enough oxygen to stay awake and communicate with us. But as far as his vital signs, 
everything was good. I mean, it was the heart was beating on its own. He was breathing on his own. Uh, so you, you, you just don't, you don't have blood products. That's the one thing that people live. You have to have for life. So I agree, Jeremy, you have to stop bleeding as quick as possible. And, and being cavalier about stopping bleeding in remote areas or hostile environments where you don't know the amount of time that you're going to have to sit and wait for an evacuation is critical. Um, and, and to, to caveat on that, um, you know, we were just uh, speaking or answering the gentleman's question from Australia. Um, and then in our dialogue about the, uh, about outback wilderness situations, or even if we're talking to our, our military audience, um, it's, you know, it's critical to also understand the correlation between the blood loss and ambient temperature, uh, altitude, all of those things. Now the body is going to be less resilient um, and more susceptible to hypothermia, to hyperthermia, um, to it's going to be uh, more vulnerable to altitude and, and all of the things that can uh, that altitude can affect, uh, can affect um, uh, haste, hape, all of those things. All of that now gets compounded when we start talking about um, blood volume and blood loss, uh, especially as Randy said, it, any amount is a concern because your body now has does not have that. And um, at one end of the spectrum, it's going to take a considerable amount of time for you to be able to naturally uh, recover from that. And then obviously, as we get down that spectrum of uh, blood volume loss, um, as I said before, we're going to reach a level of either being irreversible, uh, unrecoverable, or highly, highly vulnerable and affected by um, uh, temperature, climate, and um, and uh, altitude. Yeah, awesome. Um, you sent me a video here. I'm gonna I'll bring it up, and uh, you can you can speak to this one real quick. Yeah. What's what's this video on? So this is kind of reinforcing like some of the utilization of um, uh, different props and, and different techniques within training of, uh, you know, taping the hands, inducing the, um, the blood into the, the environment with like sprayers and things of that sort. But it also does show, and, and, and in the video, you can even hear the instructors talking about get off, you know, get off the X, get off of, get away from where you are. And again, that doesn't necessarily mean um, turn around and run. Um, it means still have shooters that are dedicated towards that threat. But obviously where you are, has attracted a high level of attention. You now have a patient and we need to find an area where we can assess that patient while we still have eyes uh, downrange, so to speak. Um, so, you know, they're again, adding, uh, <laughs> adding that training tool of just something as simple as, you know, get some food coloring and, um, uh, some sugar water to add a little bit level of uh, stickiness to it. You can, there's a lot of things out there you can use. You can use food coloring. You can use a uh, sugar. You can use creamer. Uh, it gives that a little bit of a coagulation effect. Uh, you can use corn syrup. I know current corn syrup mixed with a little bit of water gives a, a good consistency. But that stuff is number one. It's sticky, um, and it highly affects the um, the caregiver's ability to open packages. That's why you know we talk about prepping your gear and having certain things uh, maybe exposed or not in the wrapper. And for frontline EMS, the immediate rebuttal would be, you know, well, a trauma dressing. Um, uh, if I take that out of the wrapper now, it's not sanitary. Well, uh, if you're working frontline EMS, that's that's understood. Um, if you are working more of an austere wilderness uh, type situation, or more importantly, if you're working in a situation where you could potentially be shot, um, I'm not as worried necessarily about um, the, the sterility of that product versus getting it and having access to it. And if, if you've never trained to in a capacity of use it, using simulated blood 
or in a live tissue capacity, um, it, it's it's sticky. It's difficult. It's not like oh, I'm just going to grab something and rip it open. It's slipping through your hands. Um, I'll and I'll let Randy touch on this too a, a little bit, but a, a great example of that is man chest seals. I don't Asherman, um, Hyphen, whatever you're using. Those things are like super super sticky. So now your hands are all gummed up with uh, simulated blood. You're trying to get it on, and the first thing that's going to happen, Murphy's law, is it's going to fold over onto itself. Crap. That doesn't mean you can't unpeel it, but it is a, it's a mother to freaking to do that. And so again, you know, experiencing all of these things within a training capacity where we can look at it and be like, yeah, man, that was a, that was a goat rope. That was completely jacked up. That's great. Cause if we can experience that in a training capacity, now we've simulated something that probably is going to go wrong uh, in an operational capacity. And we've learned from it. That doesn't mean that it might not happen, but we know that there's a, there is a chance for it to happen. Um, you know, with uh, some of the caregivers in that particular scenario, frontline EMS might look at that and be like, okay, are you guys not teaching um, uh, BSI and, and, and use utilization of gloves? Uh, Again, I'm not going to dictate, um, I'm not going to say don't do it, but I, in these types of situations, you you might not have the time or you're getting shot at or it's a two-way rifle range. You're not, um, you're not taking the time to, to, to throw on your, your, uh, your medical gloves. You're, 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 you're working on this patient. And like I said, doing that with that simulated, um, that simulated just a spray bottle is just another, just another great tool for the toolbox uh, to take your training to the next level. Randy, anything on that one? Oh, I think Jeremy covered great. There's a there was a question here uh, from Gavin. He said, "What are you guys' views on virtual training? It's appearing more and more organizations trying to cut costs. Um, I'll I'll maybe start with this one, seeing as how we just ran a the, a large virtual training event. Um, here's the one thing I'll say: virtual training is never going to replace hands-on training. It won't. There's no way we can. There's no way that you're going to have a doctor." that goes through medical school and never puts his hands on a real person. It's it. Great. So there's certain things that we cannot replicate and or replace, but there are other things that we can use to alleviate that necessary physical training time. Um, and so that we can develop like an interleaved method of some type of remote learning or DL program or using an LMS so that there's a consistent flow of knowledge when you can't actually have, the hands-on physical training taking place. Uh, so as far as virtual training goes, can we can we use that to replace physical training? No, no generally, no, we can't. But it's a great add-on to, especially in agencies where you have a one-year training cycle where you take training for a week and then you don't touch it again for another year, that virtual training can be used to, to have that repetitious um, view and, and continually keep that front of mind for that officer throughout the year. Um, they may not get their hands on training, but at least it's, they're not losing it completely. Um, so that's all I would say to that. I don't know if you guys have a different opinion on it. I've, uh, I've worked in medical simulation now for 24 years, uh, collegiate level medical simulation. Uh, I've been part of various companies and government or not government, but uh, collegiate level programs that, are designing simulation mannequins specifically to to simulate the realism of a human, and I mean down to the to, to the point where they're taking tissues. They have the engineering department come in. They take muscle tissue and they stretch it and they pull it apart to find the tension strength, the average tension strength, so that that they can create uh, a silicone base that does the same thing. And and they're trying to do this so that it, it gets down to as close to realism as possible. And so you're talking about online training. I'm talking about mannequin simulation training. And then we've talked about live tissue and actually doing it on real people. And I think you kind of have to have them all. You, you, you need a base. I think the base can typically be found online. And then what I like about the base that I've experienced so far to date over the last 10 years or so is that 
it's also a great place to go back and refresh when you haven't done it in a while. Um, and so that online interaction is great. And then we get into the simulation mannequins. And that's really where you're going to start getting your core routines down. You have to have a simulation mannequin before you ever work on a person if you really want to be effective the first time you go out. Uh, you just have to have that. And, and then the only thing that comes down to simulation mannequin that's better would be if, if you were uh, assisting a trauma surgeon in an ER <laughs> or you have the ability to get to live tissue. Um, and not a lot of people have that. That said, uh, Jeremy has touched on a couple of times that uh, we have personally used um, racks of ribs to simulate the rib cage on a human. Um, the other thing I've done with other programs, we haven't done it at um, Apex yet, but we've gone and got a, uh, a whole leg of a cow. And you can actually take and shoot it with uh, a nine millimeter and you can put a shotgun up to it, but you buy the full leg of the cow and, uh, and you do your training right there on it. And if you've never packed a wound in live, live or not live, but real tissue, that's a very good way of simulating it also. So a progressive training is always needed. I think it's good for the beginning and for a refresher. I don't think we'll ever get away from having to have hands on. Jeremy, any thoughts on that? Uh, you said it best, Adam. There, there is no way to, there's no way to replicate um, hands-on training. Um, however, any training is better than no training at all. You know, it's uh, in in our experience with law enforcement, that's that's one of the biggest challenges is time. You know, um, our Apex course goes, you know. Uh, three day or a five day customizable course. And, you know, we'd love to have them out for, for two weeks, uh, you know, for a three day course that's force fed by, by fire hose, but it's just a matter of time for X number of, um, of officers or team members to be able to come and, and, and attend any sort of training. Um, and with that, we are without a doubt entering into a new era of virtual learning, virtual commerce, virtual business, uh, the corporate marketplace is, is moving into that just because of the current atmospherics and everything. And I don't think we're going to turn around and go in the other direction. What I hope is that, you know, we, we don't, we, we're not relying on, you know, the, the YouTube video or the, or the sessions like we're offering today, or, uh, you know, a lot of what you've put together, uh, Adam, for as, as a replacement uh, for, for hands-on training. Um, you know, even an online course where you do have training tools, you do have things where they're guiding you through uh, certain um, uh, procedures, uh, you know, that, that, that's a viable, that's a viable uh, option. But again, in that space, um, specifically talking about TCCC in the environment that we're offering it, uh, you can't add those other factors of auditory exclusion and uh, that that video that 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 you that we watched a second ago, that was a one that was a one pound black black powder charge going off um, about 15 feet from their location. That video does absolutely no justice for what one pound of black powder going off um, 15 to 20 feet from where you are. Some of the guys on the team they're like, man, I've they they're like that shut me down. That sent me into. Uh, Grossman talks about it. Um, Cooper color codes, mindset black, and they were better for it. You know, they were like, I hope to God that I'm never uh, on a call out where I receive that level of ordinance going off close to me. But now if I do, I have been inoculated to it to a certain degree. Um, and, and virtual training is never and will never be able to re replace that, at least at least not anytime, anytime soon. Yeah, we're going to get some like there's going to be packages that you send out where it's going to be like a, a an uh, olfactory box and you'll sit there and it's like, what does the dead body smell like? And it'll spray like dead bodies. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, get the big oh, VR mask on. It's, it's in my eyes. Uh, you got a little mister in your face. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but it's a great question too and it's it's a it's a chance for me to to promote kind of what we're doing next, which and I've talked to you guys about it a bit. But one of the things we want to do is do the same thing we did with the ILET Summit, but host kind of an inclusive summit on tactical medicine. 
um, not just from a law enforcement perspective, but to take in all of the experience that all of our instructors have from a military perspective and from a civilian side of things. Um, uh, you know, as we talk about a lot with, with with our instructor groups, how important it is to get outside your bubble and get other knowledge from other places that you haven't had exposure to before. Um, the one thing that I will speak to on virtual training, again, the last little piece is while, while it's very difficult to take a, a base level officer and teach them something new without getting them hands on something, it's a different story when you're talking about instructor level training yes. or, or train the trainer style courses. So what the difference is, is that as an instructor, you have the base level or you should have a base level understanding of fundamentals. So you can actually then take components and show them through a virtual. So I can go to a range and I can show advanced gunplay and skills and tactics and explain them to an instructor and they can take that video to their own range and, and reproduce that mm -hmm. on their own. And that's something that we can't do with basic level recruits. So yeah. when we talk about virtual training, I think that there's going to be a much bigger um, avenue for that on the instructor level than there will be for a recruit level. Um, and that's something that we're actively exploring as we as we roll these summits out. Um, but that's just something that I've experienced. And I think that's going to be the route that we take moving right. forward. And for accessibility, uh, absolutely. I, I think that us entering into this uh, this time and place where we are, you know, you can take you can take the good from anything, and I think it's reinforced that you know there is this avenue that we might not have uh, utilized or explored, you know, previously, um, where you can receive this level of training uh, through a video, even if it's not hands on. Um, in your free time, uh, again, law enforcement, especially now more than ever, their, their time is limited. Uh, we enter into the whole concept of, um, uh, of budget, budgetary issues of not being able to afford to send to uh, higher levels of training or maybe even training at all for that matter. So this, again, allows an avenue for those officers or operators to receive this training when they can, when they have time to, uh, to, to access it. And they can, be, they can definitely be better for it. The one thing that I will say on that is, you know, just do your homework. Uh, do, do your homework on who's teaching you what. Because I guess the only thing worse than no training uh, and not being able to have access or receive training is getting bad military slang, getting bad gouge, uh, getting, get, getting bad information, and now indoctrinating that into your tool bag. Um, and, and now you have things in there that could actually or potentially make a situation worse or do uh, unnecessary harm to a patient, especially when we are talking about medicine of any sort. Is there any other questions that people have? Um, if you guys still have questions, please put it into the chat. Let me know. We'll be happy to answer them. Um, I I don't have any questions left for, for things that people have asked me about um, from the summit. Uh, so for, for you guys, is there anything between the two of you that you've, that's been top of mind for you when it comes to training or, or anything that you've experienced recently or, or things that you see coming forward? You know, and we kind of uh, touched on this previously in, a, in another conversation, Adam, and I'll just kind of, I'll bring it up now. And, and I have a feeling this might elicit some uh, feedback from our from our viewers. And again, it's another realm that we're entering into because we've already touched on, you know, how to mitigate uh, medical intervention uh, with our first responders that may be EMS that are supporting EMS and or fire that are supporting a SWAT team. Um, or even law enforcement officers that are within a crisis site area. We've talked, we've talked about that in, in different mechanisms of how to, you know, how to work around that. But now we're entering into another space of what are we seeing now more than more than we have in any other really time in history as far as uh, as far as the prolonged exposure, and that is a uh, riot control. Uh, type situations where we're going into a situation now where we know there is a high probability of officers being hurt and or injured um, and getting to them without risking the safety and security of, uh, of EMS that may not be armed 
that may not be their function to be armed and to get to get them to uh, a higher a higher level of care. And this presents really a whole new realm of uh, of challenges uh, for some of our law enforcement and and even our first responders, uh, especially when we're talking about situations where now we're having to provide uh, provide medical aid in an environment where we could be for all intent and purposes surrounded on a, from a 180 or even a 360. And now we're in a situation where depending upon the guidelines of the department and everything that's going on right now in the grand scope, uh, rules of engagement, what have you, we do not have a positively identified threat per se, whereas within a SWAT situation of doing a high risk warrant or a direct action raid for our, uh, for our military, we kind of have a good idea of who the bad guys are. Um, generally, we identify the hands. If they have a weapon, then we're gonna go ahead and, uh, and service them accordingly. Um, it, it's not so black and white now as far as the, um, the, the clear identification of, of eliminating that threat. And I only put that in there because, you know, in the March algorithm, we consider the S before March and the S would be security. Um, so now that presents a whole new challenge of being able to provide that uh, that first response or that uh, that first aid care to an individual while technically being on just a ma a massive X because that is the environment that's going on around us. Um, I've only talked to a limited amount of officers in this scope of time that have had to deal with that uh, and utilization of their, their regular officers and utilization of SWAT teams. And they said it's presenting a very unique challenge because now they may be moving down major streets or moving into different areas where we're talking about an area much larger now than just a crisis site. We're talking about a crisis block. We're talking about crisis blocks. And now our EMS may be back in a containment area somewhere um, or a safe zone way, way, way outside of that. So it's it's just presenting, it's a new realm of, uh, of challenges to, to mitigate that. And I can only go back to, um, you know, the officers of the departments considering affecting policy where they're pushing to have shooters uh, and, uh, I'll back up. That's a, an aggressive term. Um, it's more military style term uh, for having officers trained as medics um, and having them available within these teams and integrated in these teams. So they have the tactics, they have all of the same training and everything as the officers and they're integrated. And now maybe they do have access to more than just an IFAC. Uh, they have the skill, they have the access to kit and or gear where now they can move with them, they can respond, they can uh, defend um, or engage if needed to, but they can also provide that immediate higher level of higher level of care. I should have uh, asked the questions. Anybody had questions earlier? There's there's a whole bunch that just popped up. Um, one that I'm gonna uh, one that I'm gonna reference first here, just because I don't think we're gonna have an answer. Uh, Matthew, you asked, what are your thoughts on Tem teams carrying firearms? How many do now, or are they starting the process to carry? So I think that's going to be dependent on where you are. Um, obviously, in Canada, it's not very common. Um, I know we have a lot of TEMS units that are built into our emergency response teams, but they are not armed. They have they go through all the exact same training. They do everything with the teams. They just don't carry firearms. Um, I don't. And then in the United States, I think it really varies um, state to state, county to county city to city uh so and you guys may know more about that than i do um and as far as should they be carrying firearms um you're talking to th three former military members so <laughs> i think you're gonna know our answer to that question um so but for the rest of that i think that's a great question and i'm gonna do some research for you on that um so that we can get you an answer so uh matthew if you want to send me an email directly um, with that question, I'll make sure I have one of our experts reach back out to you with a with a more succinct answer than I can give you. Um, do you guys have anything to add to that? Uh, even here in the U.S., uh, for um, for attempts, uh, frontline EMS to get the authority. Uh, I mean, you know, here in the U.S., anyone uh, barring a, a felon can can get a concealed carry permit. Uh, however incorporating that into your duties as a medic 
is is going to be extremely challenging and you know obviously i would say in most cases against uh against protocol um you know i don't see many i don't see many um attempts uh affiliated teams or whatever that are going to buy off on uh concealed carry and being able to carry themselves i'm now i'm not saying that there aren't any that do uh, or that haven't been approved uh, if there was ever a place in the United States, I would say that Texas or Arizona is probably on the front line of, uh, of utilization of that or incorporating that into their model. Randy? Mike? <laughs> I've, heard, I've heard quite a lot about it in Texas. And it kind of goes back to what I was trying to start in earlier and I got, we got sidetracked somewhere. And it has to do with that um, that level of tactical medicine. Uh, is, oh, I remember what it was. Is we were talking about when does tactical medicine start at the beginning. And I, I made a comment, and I never just expanded upon it. And I think the, the difference between tactical medicine and the military and tactical medicine in uh, law enforcement is right here what we're looking at. And that I have the ability to move through uh, a containment zone and protect myself. So that could be CHOP in Seattle. That could be, you know, any one of the big cities that's having a riot. And you're moving from your area of security to that officer forward who's down. And in the military, you carry a firearm just for said reason. And so that you have the protection available to you during that movement. Um, what I mentioned earlier, it kind of amazed me was that um, in that one podcast you had a bit back, None of the tactical organizations that I listen to on that podcast operate in that manner. They, they, none of them have the capability or I didn't hear it expressed. How's that? I, I didn't hear expressed that people have medics have the capability of moving through a containment zone to get to the tactical zone. And I, I find that interesting because that's really what tactical medicine is is you have to move through that area to get to the downed person and there's nothing safe about it. Um, and anything outside of that is not tactical medicine. If you've responded after the, after the site is secure, <laughs> that's not tactical medicine. That's just trauma medicine at that point. So I think that's really where tactical medicine needs to take that next step in the civilian community is having that ability to, to engage sooner and how they are going to def define that, I, ca I can't answer that. I know they talk about it a lot. I've talked to quite a few people that have asked me about, you know, do I think it's smart for somebody to carry a weapon as a medic? And I think you're right, JB. The, the situation depends, and it also depends on your training. But I, well, from my perspective, I also feel that if you don't have the training and you're a medic, you shouldn't be carrying a weapon um, at all. Create your own patient thing. <laughs> you know that's a that's a good point too and, and matt brought it up he said that their department is in the process of getting that approved by hire and uh you know matt if you if you end up uh dialoguing with adam um I, I look forward to adam sharing that with me because i would like to look with that model see what that model looks like um from the perspective of now are you a um uh, are, are you a, an actual officer, a badged officer with the authority of a law officer, or are you acting as a medic and now you're exercising your rights as a U.S. citizen uh, to carry, to legally carry a concealed firearm and or defend yourself um, from imminent uh, death or bodily harm or someone in your immediate space? That's uh, there's there's some loopholes to go through there. So you as an individual, as a medical care provider, um, it would be much more uh, likely and, and and civilly feasible for you to uh, defend yourself in court um, utilizing those guidelines. However, I would really like to see how your um, the department itself, whether it be the, the police department that you're supporting or the, uh, the the Thames unit that you're that you're with, I'd like to see how what it is as far as liability. Uh, and I hate I hate that word personally uh, because it comes up in every great idea that I uh, that I tend to have is liability. What is what is the liability? And 
you as the medical care provider, especially in the um, arena of what we just discussed, the, the current climate, riot control, a very uncontrollable environment um, and, a, and a rapidly fluid environment, uh, I'd be interested to, to, to see like, you know, how they, how they go about that. Uh, like I said, you, in, in court, you could articulate all day long with obviously the legality of, um, of defending yourself um, from a civil standpoint. But then when we move into the realm of you taking another human life, how that impacts and affects uh, your, your, um, uh, the EMS or, or whatever affiliate that you're working with, that, that's going to be taken into, uh, into large consideration. So, um, yeah, it's, I, I'd like to see what that model looks like once, uh, hopefully, me personally, uh, I hope that you guys get it pushed through because, again, this is personal. Uh, every person has the right to defend themselves, whether you're a medic or not, especially being sent into a situation uh, where there is very little control that, that may be going on around you. Yeah. I doubt there's going to be too many conscientious objectors going into into uh, that position. Right? No, so no I, I don't think so either. Ha however, the the objectors are and, you know, with 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 my day job from a corporate setting, I, I'm spearheading this now with, you know, and that's what I said, you know, it seems like every great idea I have, there's a legal hashtag that's attached to it. And, and it is because especially if you are a representation of another entity of another company, they are going to us as the guys on the ground, we tend to focus on the situation that's in front of us and the survivability of that situation. The policy makers, however, they're not on the ground and they're going to be looking way beyond that as to what is going to be the ramifications on the company and or on the uh, uh, affiliate that you're that you're working for at the time, and then that, that's going to ultimately be the uphill uh, the uphill battle. However, that being said, the best route for that is to find the standardization of training. Um, the just like I said before, Randy mentioned it. Uh, NREMT, all of these uh, individual entities. You know, say we were talking about uh, active shooter, uh, then alert. Uh, they would be the ones that, that you would utilize curriculum that's already developed and use that as a reference to go forward and to present to the the policymakers as to this is how it's being done somewhere else. And this is how uh, this is how we propose it. And here is the curriculum. Here's the case studies. Here's the medicine. Here's my background, my training, everything to support it. And your best shot is going to be presenting it in a package that uh, that is going to be beneficial to you as an individual on the ground. But more important, not more importantly, but as important, it's uh, going to limit the um, the the legalities uh, imposed against the affiliate you're working for. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, there's just a, a comment here. Matthew said they're lucky they have an ER doctor who's on their team also. Um, I know one ER doctor um, who happens to be former special forces assaulter. So um, if he's on your team, congratulations to you. That's a totally different story than I think everybody else has. Um, so there's a few other really, if, if we're good on that point, I think yeah. there's a few other uh, more technical questions here. Um, that are that I cannot even begin to answer. So the first one is TXA and Hextend, obviously not on the X, but should be in a medical support bag. Where I'm from, we don't carry blood products. Um, right. So that's a comment, I guess. Um, is I mean, do you guys have any thoughts on that or opinions on that? Most teams and agencies that they, they typically don't. Randy, you can probably expand on that a little bit. Yeah, TXA is only used uh, in special ops medicine now. They don't even uh, regular military combat medics uh, don't have that out on the field at all. Uh, we started out for a long time using Hextend as a volume expander. Um, at at the individual medic user level, I'm going to say that that has kind of fallen out of favor. Um, the problem that you have with the the expander products is that they that the, the Hextend is a potato starch. And it has a three to one expansion ratio. So if you're already fluid down, if you're already dehydrated from blood loss and sweat, 
and just metabolism. And then you go and throw the hex stand in and you don't back it up with additional fluid, which has happened uh, dozens of times. Um, the, it pulls the liquid, the fluid out of your body to fill those spaces. That's part of the, the genius of it is that if I have uh, 500 mLs of hex stand and 1,000 mLs of lactated ringers or sodium, uh, normal sodium, and, and I can administer both of those, then I can expand the volume significantly and it stays in the vessels to keep the pressure up. But again, if you can't expand it properly and mix it right, then you're dehydrating the patient further and, and you can kill them. The other parts of that that it, I physically witnessed this is that the medic didn't know, literally nobody had taught them the proper administration of it. And so he thought since the pressure just kept going lower, he just kept putting more on. And he ended up putting 1500 mLs of hex stand onto this guy. And basically he shot the pressure up so high he couldn't, I mean, he had, he had tourniquets failing. Um, it, it was a pretty sad situation to be involved with, but yeah, blood products, uh, you just, you got to watch the hex stand. It has to be trained properly. As far as TXA goes, once you train on TXA, it's, it's phenomenal. Um, and they have started to use it a lot more. I know in the paramedicine field in the outside the military. So, uh, I can't speak to what level cause I got out of paramedicine about three years ago. Um, and so I don't know what level they're at now, but I know that we were talking about bringing it in and I have some cities were using it. TXA is, is a great tool, um, when it's needed, uh, especially on, on, on internal bleeding from what I've seen with it used. Um, so fully supportive of both. But again, when we come back to training, I think you have to have proper training to use them right. Uh, Hexten has given the military a lot of problems and caused deaths. And, and those are documented. Uh, TXA, the, the studies at first, when it was first out there being used, there were some blood clotting factors that caused some deaths they feel possibly. But if you look at some of those cases, uh, there was also excessive amounts of TXA that were administered because of the massive amount of bleeding. Um, they were kind of going for broke at that point. So I think uh, I think it has a great place in the paramedicine field. Under that, I don't think it really has any other spot. Matthew was saying that they use theirs on their on their bus in their city. So. Yeah. Um, okay, awesome. Um, other question that came up here was, how important is it to train self and buddy care when you're exhausted? So training fitness, including tackling components. Well, I mean, that's the same as anything. Like, <laughs> it comes down to your level of training, right? How, how often do you train your shooting after you're, you physically exhausted yourself, right? How often have you trained combative after you're completely gassed, right? So it's, it's the same thing. I mean, one of my favorite things to do is uh, I take the young guys out on a walk. You know, we do uh, physical exercise all the time. So we go out, we, we do doing a, a ruck march or a, a, a pick it up and move walk with a lot of stuff carrying, carrying a lot of stuff. And I would take them out and we'd be going and then just out of the blue, I'd just yell somebody's name and I'd say uh, right arm, lower arm, massive bleeding, go. And we'd see what people would do. And it's, it's fun when you start throwing those little – just those little training environments, uh, just on your daily routines. Sometimes it really does help if you're in a team that has to rely on each other. Those little things will really build camaraderie. And it also helps you know that your buddy's standing right next to you knows what the right thing to do is. And that gives you another sense of security added, added uh, uh, not security, but awareness of yourself and your own capabilities. And you, you know you can you can ask anyone who's who's uh, taken or gone through our our apex course. Um, again, once we get to the scenarios, um, we're we're inducing that um, that physical maybe not exhaustion level, but uh, you're, you're finding out something as simple as before scenario begins having uh, having your trainees you know, sprint a hundred meters or, or whatever and come back to where you are uh, and then begin the scenario. 
all of the effects of measuring, you know, and being able to work on a patient and work, you know, shoot, move, communicate, deal with the patient, all of these things while being gassed. But an, another great thing that you find out there is uh, the guy on the team that, you know, bought everything in the Blackhawk catalog and put it on his vest. And he sees that he's lost half of that in the first 25 yards uh, because either he didn't need it or it just wasn't properly secured down. And so, you know, through that, you can utilize, you can find out a whole lot about your setup and also uh, about, you know, working on a patient um, while while physically physically gassed. You know, there's, there's a lot of, you can think outside of the box so far on using different training aids and different methods of delivery. I, I, I have to tell this because uh, it was one, one experience that I had with a fellow instructor. This wasn't at Contra Group. This was uh, at, at another uh, training facility. But I was the, uh, the AI, the adjunct, adjunct instructor that day, and it was for a TAC MedCat uh, course or class. And the primary instructor came in. He told me ahead of time. He's like, "Hey, man, just uh, make sure you bring in your uh, your Clear Eye Pro." And I'm like, "What? Okay, Roger that." So I come in, set up in the back of the classroom, and uh, this guy's a you know former uh, former SF uh, 18 Delta, great, great, great dude. He does his intro and everything. And as part of his intro, he tells the uh, trainees, he's like, "Hey, guys, look, um, you have a set of safety glasses on your desk. Go ahead and put those on at this time." And of course, the the, the students are kind of looking around like. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so they put a put on their safety glasses, and um, I noticed that he had a uh, he had his rig on, and he had a had a his uh, sidearm in the rig, and he had a blue barrel on the uh, on the sidearm, uh, and I knew that by looking at it that it was a um, simunition. Anyhow, we got into about maybe 15, 20 minutes of his presentation, and unless you've done your due diligence, uh, and even even when you do your due diligence. TAC med can be, especially in the didactic phase, it can be rather dry. Um, anyhow, one of the students, and I think second row back or whatever, I guess he started nodding off. And uh, the guy he freaking drew out and put two in his chest uh, with some munition. And he's like, uh, you have a sucking chest wound. Do it. Go now. And, you know, the, the, they, we had already covered that in uh, instruction the day prior and the, the, the guys start working on it. You don't have to worry about the guy falling asleep anymore. You've captivated, you have an audience and you've, you've, included, um, you've included a mechanism training into your period of instruction. Another thing that we do with tourniquets, we'll have, we actually do this with Contra Group. We'll have, uh, give them the tourniquets, give them the training tourniquets at the very beginning. And we're like, you need to have these with you at all times, including in the classroom. And uh, we don't care where you put them, you just make sure that you have them accessible. And, you know, moments into the period of instruction after we've covered proper application of tac uh, tourniquets, et cetera, we'll just say, you know, you, arterial bleed, um, upper left bicep, go or uh, femoral bleed, right leg, go. And they'll have to get the tourniquet on themselves. And as we progress, we may have where they're down and now they're the, the teammate or whoever's sitting next to them, they have to perform it. And that simple drill can be done easily and should be done easily within a three minute window, tops. And then you're back into the course of uh, the period of instruction. And now you've, you've injected training into the presentation that can be, you know, can be dry. You've got your students awake and alert and you you're continuously reinforcing that. And there is not enough times that you can practice putting on a tourniquet. Uh, you should be able to put on a tourniquet in the dark. You should be able to put on a tourniquet in a lot of different situations. And there's no, just like you mentioned, Adam, there's no way to get better at it. Just like with firearms, it, except we're actually doing it and practicing it. So as a, from instructor development standpoint, there's a lot of different tools that you can use in the toolbox to engage and reinforce training methodology with your students. Yeah. I love that. Um, if, if you own a training company, I would suggest you consult your legal team and have your paperwork zipped up fucking tight. <laughs> before you start doing that. I was, sitting, I was sitting in the back and I was just like, uh, uh, okay, because <laughs> students, they're, they're not really paying attention. I mean, you know, at this particular uh, company, we carry firearms with us most everywhere we go. And, uh, you know, so th in that split second of time, and he's drawing down, students don't know like what's going on. They're like, what the hell? And so it's, it was a little unorthodox, but 
you know, there was also a part of me that was like, oh, that was uh, that was definitely engaging. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, no pun. No doubt. Um, I'm looking up right here. Somebody had a question. Um, where can somebody find information on taking an Apex course? That is a, that's a great question, Jeff. Question. Um, <laughs> we we're on social media. We we utilize that as a platform quite a bit uh, through Facebook um, Contra Group. You can look us up on either Facebook or Instagram, and um, we'll get those. We'll get some uh, uh, links uh, plugged in for you guys as well. Also on our website uh, Contra Group G R U uh, dot com, uh, or you can just contact me. Contact me direct. Uh, the great thing about the Apex course is, you know, we do have three or five day courses. The five day courses are fully customizable. Um, you know, we have our curriculum set, but we try to work with the, uh, the, the head of training for that particular program and customize the training to their team. Not just saying that, you know, uh, we're just going to work on this or we're going to, we're, we're going to work on that. Um, right now we are actually experiencing some uh, difficulty with our website and we're doing a little bit of an overhaul to include more information on it. So if, if you go to the Contra Group portal right now, it might be down. Um, when it comes back up, we will have links to courses uh, that we're going to be offering. We're looking at a course right now in, on the East Coast um, in North Carolina at the uh, North, Car North Carolina State um, uh, Justice Academy. Uh, they have a full training site there, and we do quite a bit of our training uh, out of there for our East Coast region. Um, the other, the other thing to kind of point out is just the simple fact that, uh, you know, three day a th three day course is great, and that those are the ones that we do the most of. But pushing really towards that the five day course where you're getting more repetitions. It's, I'm not saying you're, it's any more training, but you're just getting more repetitions and more scenarios. And, and that is, that's really the meat and potatoes of our, of our, uh, our training program is the scenarios incorporating all of these different effectors uh, into the training system um, so that to a certain degree, we can be inoculated to the things that are as important and focus on the things that are priority. Yeah, guys, the, the website's down at this time right now. So if you guys want to get a hold of uh, Jeremy, you can either get a hold of him on LinkedIn. You can get you can go through me. Um, I'd say go through me because then I'm gonna get I'll get you signed up for his course, and then Jeremy owe me a bottle of scotch or something. Exactly, the good stuff. <laughs> the good stuff. Um, so or Jeff, get a hold of me. Jeff, what I'll do is I'll cover half of your course cost. If you go if you go to one of these guys, I'll cover the other half for you. Um, so you come through me and I'll, I'll do that for you. So to talk to just on that real quick, Adam, uh, the, the way the model exists is what we really try to push for is we try to push for multi-jurisdiction training. And when I, that does not mean that is, uh, that's the only train that we offer, but we push for that on purpose. And I, I know that a lot of my Leos out there, they're kind of cringing, um, because it's, that they want courses that are specifically for their guys. And that's that's fine, we can do that. The reason that we push for the multi-jurisdiction training is because finding other teams within your area, or other officers in your area and working with them uh, through a training capacity, in my opinion, is great because you there's a very high likelihood of having to work with them in, a, um, in an operational capacity. Uh, we've had courses where we've brought in local uh, state, municipal, and uh, and even federal, and those are those are the interesting courses to say the least. Um, but it's it, it's good for them to all be able to have opportunities to work together. Uh, if a agency wants to be a host uh, for a three or a five day program, we immediately give the host agency uh, three seats uh, for free for their team members. And then we kind of let them or allow have them assist us in bringing in these other agencies of maybe their choice or that they would want to work with. So, awesome. Yeah, uh, Chris was asking, is it offered in Canada? I don't think you guys have come up here yet, but I also think that we're Can we, we come to Canada with guns right now. I don't know. We have a, <laughs> we, 
we, have a, we do have a game plan. So, so Crystal, I'm working really closely, especially in Ontario, um, with the Canadian Tactical Officers Association and Ontario Tactical Advisory Body. Um, and so there's a lot of really high-end training facilities in Ontario, uh, Millbrook and Reticle, to name a few, that are run by our JTF and uh, our Cansofcom guys. Um, so if that's the case and, and we can spool something together, um, we'll have these guys come up to Canada to run a course. Um, so we just have to get the, the facilities burked out. And, and also they're the ones that are going to have um, the ranges and everything that we need on the on the firearm side of things because for us in Canada obviously that's the biggest component that's the hardest part um, is to get that authorization and it'll have to generally be with knowing what these guys do it'll probably have to be at a military range of some or a private range so um, yeah that's answer that question is there anything else any other questions here I'm missing something uh, currently EMT okay. Um, yeah, good luck interrupt across the board without two weeks of quarantine. Yeah, we're not going to do it right now during COVID. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, Matthew's asking, what all do you need to have to host the class? So I'm assuming from an agency perspective. Uh, if if I'm if, if I'm understanding that correctly, we do have a we have a minimum of uh, 14 trainees uh, for a class. Uh, that does not mean that we won't or we have never gone outside of that. That's kind of uh, our model, model, and we do not go outside of uh, outside of 22 trainees. And that's primarily because of our pool of cadre, and we do a lot of live fire um, in and around close proximity, and we we attempt to keep um, uh, at the very least. Uh, three to one instructor ratio, but we try to go for a two to one uh, instructor ratio, especially when we get to those um, to those uh, live fire and very dynamic drills. Um, we we want to make sure that obviously the safety is, is the highest priority. I hope that answered that question. Yeah. Um, he's a uh, question here. Is it open to civilians? Ah, that is a great question. Uh, about a year and a half ago, we sat down over probably a bottle of scotch and uh, we were making a determination on whether we wanted to go that route. And the determination was no. And that has nothing to do with A, our ability, has nothing to do with uh, um, training civilians uh, because I, I train civilians outside of uh, Contra Group just on, on, on my own. And what it does have to do with, it goes back to the legality, um, the not legality, but liability. Uh, it's the, the liability there for, you know, the insurance and, and everything like that uh, is, is, is very, very high. Um, and we, we want to be able to focus initially and primarily on our, on our first responders and in our military um, really, really our, our law enforcement. Uh, because we feel that there's a need there, and that we can we can help sharpen we can help sharpen the blade. Yeah, awesome. I was just gonna say, I mean, the second that you start putting civilians and either military members or law enforcement members on the same range together, you don't you don't want to um, do that paperwork. That, from, from, that, from that standpoint, that that would that would never ha that would never ha we would never even consider that yeah. uh, training uh, civilians exclusively. You know. Who knows? Maybe, maybe down the road we'll be at a, a different place. But combine, I, I can't. I don't know of any team who would, who would work with, um, uh, work with civilians. And again, that's not a slight on on civilians. It, that does go back to a liability thing as well, um, un, unless they were had some type of previous training or with a military team or something of those sorts. So. Yeah, and I was just gonna say too, it comes down to that we were we were talking about that base level of training. Um, a lot of what your course your course is a, you're anticipating them to come in as trained operators, anyways, as officers yeah. or operators. So if they don't have that base level of training, you can't start from them from, from scratch and then get to the more advanced components of what you're trying to teach. Now, now. In, in regard to, and this was something that when this whole concept came up, we didn't consider courses with exclusively medicine and no firearms, primarily because we like firearms a lot and 
the ability to be able to include that in is, is, is something that we feel like we're good at and, and we're passionate about. Um, you know, especially in this virtual space, uh, that there is a high probability that we will come back around to the to a concept of doing training for uh, for civilians uh, with a medicine uh, a medical only focus, and and that is not outside of our scope. Yeah, Randy, you're just you're sending me a thing there. I put the the website up, but you said you do some training um, where you are for. Yes. Some yeah, we do it for non. So what we do. Uh, Believe it or not, I've had probably the biggest reach uh, reach out has been from the motorcycle, like the adventure motorcycling community and, and motocross riders. They get out there into 50, 60 miles into the mountains, the back country. And uh, uh, I think geez, three weeks ago, four weeks ago, one, uh, two of the guys literally called me up and they were like, yeah, so-and-so uh, crashed his motorcycle, cracked five ribs, punctured a lung. Uh, it took him two and a half hours to get e back out. You know, situations like this. Um, and we run a, a course that basically breaks down the, uh, the March protocol. We use the March protocol and we teach that and we apply it to uh, backcountry scenarios. And then we also throw it into some urban scenarios. Like uh, the fact that I like to stress to people is that March, uh, uh, this, my experience has shown that people in law enforcement don't like to use the word tactical, period. If it says tactical, or it's tactical colored, then it can't be used by law enforcement because it makes them military oriented. And so you have to get that tactical piece of the word out sometimes so that they, they don't feel like they're threatened by something that they don't see. And so when I teach the March protocol to a lot of people, I try and break it down so that people understand we do this in combat, you know, when you, we don't run out in the middle of the street, there's care under fire, and then there's tactical field care, there's two phases of care, right? And, and that, those two phases of care, they, they address everything you, that could happen in any high threat or high value, uh, not uh, high energy event. Thank you. High energy event. So you're going to have your, your, your care under fire. So if you're on the freeway and you get piled up in a 20 car pile up and you see the person in front of you is bleeding tremendously from their head because they weren't wearing a seatbelt and smashed their head. You just don't jump out of your car and go run it up. That, that would be the same as care under fire. You don't run out into a fray of bullets because your friend fell over. So it's the kind of the same, the same mindset. And you have to show people this from a different way. So that's what we do there um, predominantly for people that have never had any medical training. Uh, I've had uh, local law enforcement that have come to my class privately. And uh, they appreciate it. They say it's a good expansion on what they learned on their TECC or their TENS courses. And uh, the, the biggest thing that I'm able to give them that, I mean, in Contra Group with the Apex, you get the same thing. It's the hands-on. It's if you get the repetition of hands-on and you can repeat that over and over in one single class, the more times you can repeat it, uh, the better you're gonna be able to use it down the road. So uh, that's out there. If anybody's in the in the Northwest uh, of the United States and interested in, uh, in that training as well. In support, of, in support of that, uh, Randy, I'll just say this: that you know, I've known I've known Randy for for quite a few years now, and you know, um, his not only friendship but mentorship within the the realm of tactical medicine and just medicine in general is 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 absolutely incredible. Um, I can personally say that there's maybe one or to if that other people that if I was in a situation where I needed care under fire, that that, that guy is, is is the one that I would, you know, that I would pick um, his knowledge, but even more so than a person's knowledge is their is their experience um, and, and their technical knowledge. And uh, Randy is uh, is a Yoda of his craft. And I know he appreciates that uh, that comparison. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, there's a quick question here. Uh, that they were asking if there's a Canadian equivalent for T tri C um, that we have T triple C in Canada. I thought, yeah. um, it's used. It's for Canadian forces. It's used not only for our members before they deploy, but also for any NGOs that go over. Everybody takes T triple C, um, and so and I think it's the same for all our law enforcement agencies as well. All the TAC teams. I think they always use T triple. It's a stand. It's like it's a North American standard. I think it's almost an international standard. Yeah. 
uh, most of the um, Commonwealth countries. Yeah. So, um, yeah, awesome. Is there? I think we're. You know, we've we've been at this for three hours. Uh, so. Uh, You're right. It goes by Jeremy, fast. Jeremy's been at it for like two. <laughs> I'll haze myself later. So he's yeah, got to stick. Yeah. He's got to stick around for an extra hour by himself. Uh, there you go. That's why. But um, I, there's a there's a video that I'm going to play here real quick at the end of this. Um, but before we go, um, last last words from either of you gentlemen about anything you, we've touched on today. Go ahead, Randy. Ah, he throw that to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Ah. I like uh, tactical medicine and law enforcement. Like I said, it's that it's that that fine area between being at the ambulance or being at your car, being in the the Hellcat or whatever vehicle you're driving in, and getting out and moving to the point of contact where where aid is needed. And I think that a lot of people out there believe they're doing tactical medicine uh, or they're engaging in it, but until you're in that two way rifle range, moving down through it. That's when tactical medicine starts. I think that's what that's what has to be recognized um, as as a capability for training level, because some people right now, right off the bat, you, you can say, "Oh, well, you would have to put on full body armor, carrying M9 bag or the new the new bag, and uh, and and a, and a pistol, and you with one other or two other medics are going to move down this street to the building." enter the building where there's an active firefight going on and then render care. That is tactical medicine right there. The care that you actually give is the same care you give in a, in a car accident. So it really doesn't change the care. It's the movement from the point of safety to the danger. So just keep that in mind, I think. Um, you know, one of the first things that, that comes to mind, uh, it was a, a book that, that I read as a, as a young Marine um, written by a former CAG operator, Master Sergeant Paul Howe, would highly recommend uh, leadership and training for the fight. Uh, there's some pictures in there too. I, I like pictures, but uh, it's it, so much of his experience is profound. He has a, a diverse background, not only tactically, but also from a medical standpoint. And uh, there's one quote of his where um, he says, to go into a fight, a person must be physically, emotionally, tactically, technically capable of enduring the rigors of combat for prolonged periods of time while keeping himself and other teammates alive. And there is, that is such a profound statement because that is all encompassing, you know, physically, mental, mentally, tactically, technically, being a master of your craft. And we will never be true masters of our craft. And when we get to that point where I think or I believe that I am the master of my craft, then I need to get out of the business, uh, in, in, whether it be operational or even instructing, because there's always something that we can learn. We can always sharpen the sword a little bit more and prepare ourselves. That ultimately will help prepare the people. If we're instructors or trainers, it'll help us prepare them. Um, so, you know, to endure the rigors of combat, and obviously his preface there was for a combat situation, but if you are a Leo, if you're SWAT, if you're putting on a badge and a gun each day, or even if you're supporting uh, those entities and you're not carrying yourself, you are potentially going into and facing the rigors of combat. Um, and being prepared for that isn't just being a good medic. It isn't just being a PT stud. It is all of these components that are, that are mentioned in that statement that make you the most effective that you can be. Um, and the final thought to that is uh, a buddy of mine who is, again, another for, uh, former CAG operator, told me something as a young Marine that was also very profound and I've carried it with me. And Grossman touches on this in quite a, quite a bit in, um, uh, in his methodology. Understand and embrace the fact that we as operators, as law enforcement, as medics, whatever the case is, we can do every single thing right. We can have the best gear, we can have the best training, we can be the tip of the spear, 
and you can still get smoked or you can still have a patient or a teammate die. And I say that because these are things that affect that emotional component of the statement made by Paul Howe. Being prepared and seeing the movie, uh, people who have attended any type of training that I've done before, and I got this from another mentor, is watch the movie in your mind. See the movie in your mind. Go through all of it before it happens and see it, process it, smell it, taste it, and let it seep in. And then that way, when it becomes game day, you're not going to be uh, be sent into or potentially sent into a mindset black because you haven't processed those things ahead of time. Um, so some, not my words, but some very prolific words from uh, some great warriors. I love it. I love it. Well, gentlemen, um, thank you guys both so much for taking the time and, and joining us here and answering questions from everyone. Um, I know it's not going to be the last time we collaborate. There's going to be a lot coming down the pipe uh, with us, so I'm excited for that. Um, and so thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, and as always, if you haven't already shared this, uh, the IRTs that we run for the Tactical Breakdown podcast every week, we run this um, we, every week. Um, we don't. We run it every month. Last Thursday of every month, um, you can join us for the free Instructors Roundtable. We cover a new topic every month, um, a new set of instructors. And um, if you haven't already checked out the International Law Enforcement Training Summit, make sure to do that. Um, it's still available for everyone. We do ask that you, there is a slight purchase, but all that goes to charity to support officer mental health. Um, so it's it's really worth it. You get about $8,000 worth of training for like a hundred bucks. Uh, so not the worst deal out there. Um, so guys, thank you again so much. Thank you, Adam. We appreciate video to, uh, to kick us off. And if you guys just hang around for a quick AAR after, we'll, uh, we'll touch base and then be done. Sounds good. Identify different types of training that is going to increase their combat survivability. Once we realize where there was a deficit, we realize that we can make a difference. Not only is they capable of going in, identifying, and mitigating a threat or target, they have to also get that tactical field care to save a life. 91% of death from a combat or a traumatic event is caused by not paying attention. It's from booting out. A simple tourniquet can be saved by these lines. That's very basic type of thing that we're trying to teach, but that's not should be zero. Our tactics are aggressive because we understand that our threats are aggressive. What people don't understand is if you fall to the level of training, to a time of stress, you can lose very basic things. Fine motor skills, auditory and visual experience. People can't hear, they can't see. So the only way you can really push your abilities is to find out A, what your abilities are, and B, to bring yourself into a zone that is very uncomfortable. Law enforcement are prepared for a mass casualty situation. Start to understand. Shooter situation on the Las Vegas Strip. Approximately 50 people have been killed. Two shooters have been killed in a Florida nightclub. The first of the two explosions rocks the sidewalk along the course, spewing shrapnel as the crowd is gathered at the finish. When our force on defense don't have the necessary tools, to defend not only us, but themselves, it does them a disservice. It does us a disservice. Please have been telling rhythm to the North Carolina State Authorities and word and also possible self operating asshole. Hey, JB, were you saying there's no sound on that video? Yeah, it was It was really, really low, at least on my end. It was. Uh, okay, I'm going to send, well, I'm going to send everybody the link to that so they can check it out. No worries. Yeah. All right, guys. Thank you so much for joining us, and we'll talk to you.